Hey kids, it's time to get some SML podcast all up in that. What's up, everybody? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. Joining as usual, Cole, how are you doing? Fuck, I guess I'm all right. You, th- you guess you're all right. Yeah, I, I spewed like seven F-bombs before we even started, so I figured I might as well start off with one for this, too. Yeah. And uh, I'm on a roll today. <laughs> you are on a roll, but you're not alone. Purnell's here. Purnell, how are you doing? I had a hefty breakfast and some pumpkin coffee. I'm surprisingly still yawny, but... You know, only just because energy levels are strange. But otherwise, I'm doing great. That is good to hear. And it's good that you're here because this is a special episode. We have a guest joining us from Ichigo Ichie. David Ventura, how are you doing? I'm just fine. Thanks for having me. Did I get the company name right? You nailed it. All right. I was watching the ID at Xbox stream the other day, and I heard Timber mess it up a few times. So I was practicing. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an awful. So how are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, I'm doing just fine. We had a nice, uh, cool afternoon, or actually nighttime now, uh, raining here in Stockholm. Rainy. Yeah. Honestly, I can't fault that. It's rain has been all the rage as of late, and it always comes at the most bizarre times, too. You never expect it. I mean, you can Unless check the you weather Unless you watch channel. the weather, yeah. <laughs> uh, now the weather report lies. It totally lies. They'll give you some, like, rinky-dink percentage, like 5% chance of rain with a side of hail balls or something. You don't know what to make out of it. So you're just, like, winging it. And out of nowhere, torrential downpour occurs. Yeah. And, you, you know. Yeah. But this is not about the weather today. We're here to talk about a game. David, you're here to talk about your brand new game, Hexagroove Tactical DJ. Just hit on the Xbox One. For the people who don't know what this game is, give us the sales pitch. So Hexagroove is a real-time strategy game, which is heavily based on music. Uh, You get to play as a DJ. Uh, You're in a club, and you're working with a club full of uh, party people, and they want to hear some great tunes. So what you do is you combine different musical instruments in real time, uh, drums and synthesizers and vocals and things like that. And there's a set of rules you have to follow. And if you follow the rules well, great music is produced and the crowd goes wild and the lights are flashing and uh, confetti's going off, things like that. If you don't, uh, maybe the crowd gets bored and it's game over and you give them another shot. And how exactly do you do well at this game? Because I've been I've been getting some A ranks. <laughs> Thank you for doing the do, Joe. Because Yeah, <laughs> I was going to go there if you didn't. <laughs> I've been getting some A ranks, a couple of B ranks. I cannot for the life of me get an S rank. Okay. Uh, what What are the secrets to playing this game? Explain, go through the process of doing a good song in this game and what the hell you have to do to actually succeed while having fun. Because I'm nailing the second part. I'm having fun. But I, I'm, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, really. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very novel uh, gameplay interface. And there's lots of new rules that people aren't familiar with. That, that That's natural. The way that you get an S rank is you follow what we call the six rules of music making. So there's uh, six different elements that are important for making a song that changes and changes in a timely fashion and changes in a fashion that flows over time. The same way real songs do when, when you're listening to music in a club or, or on the radio. So if you follow these six rules, uh, you can get up to 10 points in each one. And then if you have an average over, let's say, maybe nine, then you can get an S rank. So uh, you're probably nailing two or three of the rules, but you haven't some trouble with the others. Do you remember which ones you have? Flow, I'm getting a six on. Okay, flow. So flow is about adding or moving things in uh, four bar increments, musical uh, bars. So there's a certain light that goes around the edge of the interface and that flashes blue. 75% of the time, and green for the last 25%. So when it's flashing green on the upper left-hand corner, that's the fourth bar. So when you're triggering music on the fourth bar, it's going to launch on the first bar because we have everything quantized, so the beat is always matched and everything sounds good. So if you make all your changes when it's in the upper left-hand quadrant, then you'll get a 10 in flow. Gotcha. See, I... I always see one switch from blue to green. I'm like, oh shit, I got to change this immediately without thinking how it's going to work with the flow of the song. So that makes a lot more sense now that it's explained to me and I'm not a complete moron. I'm just mostly a moron. (laughs) 
Well, actually, so I have sounds- a follow up related to that then yeah, because sure. I think Joe and I are in a similar predicament here. Like, but I want to get waves. Like, what difficulty do you plan on, Joe? Uh, I started on easy, but I've been dabbling on medium and I'm failing on medium, even though the crowd is jumping and bouncing along and I'm not sure why I'm failing on medium. And that's exactly where I'm at too. So like you'll play a song and at base, the rules seem to be. So for those who are listening, like what the heck are they talking about? The gameplay interface is a giant circle. And at point of the circle, there are smaller circles that correspond to instrument nodes and those instruments need to be activated so they can play a loop over that goes with the overall song that's being played and you're turning them on and off based on the beat and also the situation on the song proper now pernell just turned into review pernell well i I didn't want people to be like what the heck are these goobers talking about (laughs) Um, so what i'm playing typically the understanding I have is that when the when the node is blue, that means it's doing its job. And even if there isn't a euphoria gaze pointing towards the center, the node is still doing its job. It's just for whatever reason, it's not generating euphoria at the time. Mm-hmm. But when you get to a point where you see it turn green, you want to rush over and reactivate it so it's back to producing a new loop that everyone's feeling fresh about. And of course, right. when they're all playing properly, you got the guys doing the big, the beach ball in the crowd, so you're like, I'm doing a good job. But on one particular track, no matter how well I do it all of those, my hit points start to decrease. And no matter what I do, I always die around the four-minute mark. Mm-hmm. And this is on medium. Uh huh. Okay, I see. And you haven't gotten, you haven't changed it when it was blue and gotten any too soon or anything like that, because that'll penalize your health. Exactly. Like at first, I was like, oh, it must be what it is, because I was getting a few too soon, because I was like panicking, trying to figure out if there's something I'm missing mm-hmm. or what I was already doing. But once I stopped doing that, I was still ultimately end up dying. Right. So if you change it. When the phase indicator, that, that big circle's light is green, then you mm-hmm. get a bonus. So if you, if you have good flow, every change will produce uh, a bigger boost to your health restore and also a bigger flow of euphoria. So that'll get you through level faster. So that's one thing. Another thing is that your health is naturally going to decrease over time as the audience gets kind of fatigued both uh, mentally and emotionally uh, and physically about, about the music that you're playing. So okay. it's going to come down. But when you do a mini game, you get a boost back. A health restore depending on how well you do the mini game so if you're doing well with the drum rolls you're doing well with the uh, audio effects then you'll get more health back but if you're having a hard time with those mini games you might be getting a really minimal uh, boost to your health as well and i will say the mini game that generally gives me the most grief is the uh the line tracer not because i can't trace lines but sometimes when the way the camera comes at it like you'll be coming towards the camera so mm-hmm. when it does like a line change it's such a turn like oh caught me off guard and at that point i get like a, <laughs> a slight moment where i'm like crap i could have had a perfect but no um but that makes sense i'm about to give that a shot then but what you're saying though is that as long as you do the mini games well and you're good with changing the nodes and flipping them back on yeah you're still doing solid you, you should be doing okay then at that point yeah i think when you get towards the end of medium it starts to get the gravity of the health starts getting to be able to factor and maybe you have to play a bit more aggressively um mm-hmm. and in hard in particular when you get to hard, then you need to do something where you're you're throttling. Basically, you're intentionally turning it off, even though you're still getting euphoria, because you turn it back on and you can get a, a quick boost of euphoria. They, over that's what I wanted to hear. I was wondering about that. Like, is there ever a time when you want to intentionally stop something that is at the time doing well for you? Like, if it's blue, everyone's hopping. But I always yeah. worry that if I go to turn it off, the game's going to say it too soon or something, and it's going to penalize you for turning the note off. Right. You get it too soon if you change it, but you don't get it too soon for stopping it. Oh. So you stop it by hitting the button, the same button that you yeah. use to trigger it. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And also, and also there's loop attributes, which I think unlock after you get about nine or ten Bs, I think. Um, and then loops are not the same in terms of just how they sound, but they also have buffs and nerfs to them. So like you'll see one with like a fire icon and one like with a, a hypnotizing icon and things like that. And those buffs and nerfs make the different loops affect the audience's health and also your euphoria growth in different ways. So that's where the strategy really comes into play, where you need to start being uh, choosy about which loops you're using to really get through those hard stages. Okay. 
So I like the sound of this. Like that, that's why I was thinking about this when like we were doing the interview today. I was like, but I'll do the review till Tuesday. And I'm like, I'm glad we're talking to you now because I need to get I need some strategy advice from the man himself. <laughs> because because I know there's like something going on here that I'm not seeing. It's like a lot of other rhythm games you play where if you just kind of come at it based on what you see other people doing in the arcade, you're like, what the hell is this? And you might think you're doing well, but there's always that guy you sitting in the corner drinking a soda, like, nah, man, the real secret's over. Over here, you gotta push left, right, and you do that, and yeah, you know it goes. It pretty much the real potential of the game gets unlocked when you learn it from a pro. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, I know the rules fairly well, so if you have any other questions, just ask. <laughs> <laughs> I am actually curious about one thing for sure, which is that this game from a rhythm game, because I've played a ridiculous amount of them over the years, and this one comes at the genre from a direction that, to be quite frank, no one else has done before. Mm. Um, this is very unique in that regard for the genre. So I am curious, what was your inspiration for this product? Um, uh, I'm really glad you asked that because I've got a background that kind of blends both arts, music, and technology. Um, and I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to learn music and how to make music learning easier for people and also how to let, maintain uh, creativity. So for me, being creative in a game, of course, there's lots of different ways you could be creative. Like if you're in a sandbox, you know, who you're beating up or who you're helping or how you're, what buildings you're sitting on top of. There's a lot of chances for creativity and personal expression there. But with rhythm games, there's not. Because it's right or it's wrong. You're either on the beat or you're not. And you're playing someone else's uh, canned music, which could be great if you like, you know, you love smoke on the water or whatever it is. But <laughs> if, you're lo- if you're looking to express yourself, you know, there's not a lot of music games to let you do that. So I was trying really hard to straddle the realm between giving someone an instrument to play where there's infinite creativity and giving them a game that's completely on rails, like Guitar Hero, where there's only one right or wrong to it. Um, so this way, I hope I can like take people from the game side of uh, following rules, getting points, maximizing your score, unlocking stuff, and kind of lead them slowly towards the realm of, yes, you can express yourself, you can make music. It's been tough up until now, but we're going to help you get started, and then you're going to discover... Um, a side of yourself perhaps you hadn't seen before in terms of being able to, to be musical and to perform with, with yourself or with other people. So that's that's what I wanted to achieve with this title. And I like the idea behind that descriptive too, because if you think about a lot of other genres of games, even though they ultimately come with their own goal at the end of the level, so to speak, a lot of times they give you some variations on how you can go about achieving it. If you take something simple like Contra, like Ancient Katra. It's like, get to the end of the stage and beat the boss. Okay, well, there's a variety of weapons you can pick up, that you can choose which one is best for you. You can take the upper spread path shot. or the lower path. Yeah, go of course the spread <laughs> shot until the laser comes about and then later. <laughs> no, spread shot. <laughs> but, like, you get options to make that play session sort of your own. Like, you get to make decisions that affect right. the way the game plays out. But with music games, it's just like you said, it's usually, here are a bunch of arrows or notes or something, and you have to hit them exactly as the game tells you. No room for uh, no room for expression there. So, yeah. hearing that, it actually makes a lot of sense where you were coming from with this here. Um, prior to, like, making this game, did you have, have any experience with any of the arcade, uh, you know, like, rhythm games themselves, or was it all from your personal experience? Um, yeah, I mean, I played, I've played rhythm games, uh, in the arcade, but like, like everyone has, and there's ones I love a lot. I actually worked at a Japanese studio for 12 years called Ennis. Um, mm. and there we made, we made rhythm games for Nintendo DS and for, uh, music titles for Microsoft and Xbox 360 and some stuff for PSP. Uh, so I, I spent the biggest part of my, uh, game dev career making music games, both karaoke style and dance style games where you're following something along and then the, the traditional rhythm stuff like uh, titles of the beat agents, Owen Don, Guitar Man, stuff like that. I knew it. That was what it was. I was like, I, I don't want to say it and be wrong, but I was like, I know I've played one of those <laughs> games. You said DS and you said Ennis. So I'm like, it had to be a Winden. Had to be yeah. a Winden. Yeah. Yes. And Elite yeah, Beat so- Agents. Uh, great games, by the way. It's cool that you were involved with those. Yeah, thanks. Though, so, like, honestly, like, hearing that, yeah, it's honestly to me like you aside from like you you basically come at this from both the the developer and personal experience angles quite well like it's a it's actually a breath of fresh air to hear that and honestly the game itself i have been enjoying it i want to get better at it and based on what you've told us today i do foresee myself going along that route um as you, what would you say was probably the more complicated thing that you had to come up with as far as this game design was concerned? Mm, 
I guess there were two parts, and one one part was the compromises that you have to make on music to make it a game. Um, mm-hmm. So my, my myself as a musician, there's things that I wanted to do the ways that I DJ when I'm playing, uh, you know, free form in a club or, or or a set or something like that. And then you have to simplify it for the purposes of both for gameplay and for the rules to be consistent, and also for people who have you know zero knowledge about music coming into this. So that was part of it. Um, and then trying to take it, keep it in a way that to me felt like you could still make lots of different kinds of music. There was a lot of chance for expression, even though musically what you could do is not as sophisticated as like a full professional piece of music software. Uh, that was one half. And then the second thing is, um, we've been kind of dancing around a bit talking thus far is, is how do you, uh, present this to people who have no idea, you know, what's inside your head and what you're coming from. So getting like a tutorial and getting onboarding was something really tough, uh, that we struggled with throughout, uh, the process. Uh, we had a very short cycle and limited resources to build the game. And, um, at one time we made a tutorial, which is very different from what's in the game now. And it was like very handholdy and like, do this, do this, do this, do this. Great. Do this. Um, and we tested that and people could follow the tutorial and they could do well in the tutorial, but they still didn't understand why they were doing what they were doing. They're like, okay, I did what you said, but I don't know why still. No. And that's, so we kind of, we sense. kind of failed in that aspect, you know, because like, I'm trying to take the concepts of music and boil it down into in a way, uh, with language and also with a, a, uh, a stream of stuff that's like a little bit at a time so you're not overwhelmed and that didn't work so we we kind of chucked that aside and we talked to nintendo about it because this originally launched on switch and we asked them you know like should we work on a tutorial more or should we work on the in-game experience and they're like well the core game experience is really interesting so you should double down on that so that's what we did with the time we had we focused on improving the core game experience and polishing that and the clubs and the music um and then the onboarding that as it is you know we have like a whole manual in the game but you know if you if you don't understand my English and if you don't have a, uh, a patience to read tons of text, which is understandable, then it can be a very hard game to, to get into. I don't have any musical ability whatsoever. And so <laughs> I struggled with this game. Like I just did the, the trial version of it and I was just, I felt like the biggest fucking idiot to ever see the light of day. <laughs> oh, sorry, that, that's not the kind of feeling. But I do here's the, the funny thing: like my oldest daughter, who is in band, loves music, plays the trumpet. She just comes in, sits down, picks up the controller, and she just blasts it. And she's like, "This is so awesome!" And I'm like, <sighs> "I can't, <laughs> I can't carry a tune in a bucket if you told me how to put a lid on it." <laughs> <laughs> and I honestly feel like that that makes sense in its own right because like for as much effort as a developer would want to put into making a game accessible to pretty much anyone that comes to it which is very appreciated and respected mm-hmm. it's something that should be done at the end of the day you're still going to have folks who just don't quite click with it and others who just are gravitating right towards it like I always use the example of uh, back in the day, there was a Japanese game. I was a big fan called Poppin' Music, um, mm-hmm. which was a Konami game. And um, I had the, the home controllers and everything. I went all in on this game and getting it in my home. So when I would go to friends' houses on occasion, they'd have a game party, and I'd bring my Japanese PlayStation, set the whole thing up. And they're like, oh, what game is this? It's called Poppin' Music. And I'm like, explain to them, like, word for it, this is how the game works. Buttons flow down like piano scales corresponding with these buttons, you press it when it gets here. Like, that's the description of the entire gameplay style. And people are like, ah, I, I don't get it. I don't understand this. I'm like, <laughs> you push the button when it gets there. Like, that, that, that is literally it. And they were just weren't having it. They weren't having it. So it's like, sometimes you can make it as simple as you want, but it takes something more to get someone to go, now this makes sense. It's like, it usually ends up being so- either someone else's experience or... Maybe just the right session with the least amount of alcohol. I don't know. <laughs> but um, but ultimately, sometimes it takes a little bit more than what can be explained by the dev. So, But the fact that you even make the attempt to do it is is a good thing for sure. Yeah, sometimes we made some, we, sometimes we made when some, it comes to music games, you just have to accept you don't have that ability. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I kept interrupting you there. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we know this has always been the sticking part for people to get into it. So I, I made like a video series after we launched the game explaining the six rules of music making I did before with just like just one video at a time. Uh, that's not in the game. It's on YouTube, though. But I, I don't know if that helps. But I think I agree with you guys completely that 
when you go the, the more the more radical I think the game is at the beginning, the more you need to help guide people in from what they're familiar with. So that's something that, that we can we can improve on. I would say at the end of this recording, if you could drop that link into the Skype chat because Joe could mention it when we do the review proper this coming week. Sure. Yeah, 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 I, I could throw I could throw it in the show notes. We could have a link down there to all of them, or at least a playlist of all of them. Yeah, that way people can check them Thanks. out. Because yeah, like I don't know, like I I would definitely want. Honestly, I feel like I'm I've been playing this game. I'm still probably going to watch the video. So <laughs> hey, no complaints there. Make sure to drop it in. So I'll say but, I feel like I've learned so much more about playing this game, talking to you than I have just by hands on. It, it definitely helps having someone they're explaining like i can imagine people playing this at, at like trade shows have you ever shown this off at, at like pax or magfest or yeah. anything like that i, I yeah, can imagine we, people just getting really into it during those shows yeah we i mean when people come by i've gotten better i guess in my my you know 30 second explanation of what they need to do and uh showing someone and then letting them try it yeah it's definitely a lot better i think than any kind of video so definitely what has the reception I'm, been at trade shows? Like, ha, has anyone come by and just like floored you guys with their skills out of nowhere? Just any any cool stories like that? I think in general, we found that like uh, I think like eight out of ten people uh, really like it, and that half of those people, or maybe a third, are just nuts about it. Like they they become obsessed with it, think it's the <laughs> coolest thing. Some people, like you say, like they have no idea and then they like it and then I can see the, the frustration on their face and they feel kind of stupid and I feel bad. They feel stupid and they don't get it and they leave. Um, but the people that are usually the best are our kids. Like you said, like I was like maybe like 11 year old kid one time this came up and he's like just looked at this kind of like very sure look on his face. He was studying the game from the sidelines. And he sat down, and started playing it. And then he was like nailing the most difficult uh, <laughs> drum and bass loops and everything, like the, the rhythm mini games. And I didn't have to say anything. He, he played for like, I don't know, like 45 minutes or something like that. Because nobody else was around. Nice. And and yeah, so some people just just dive into and it. And he I left was, a certified impressed. DJ that day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here's your badge, sir. Start playing clubs tonight. <laughs> I got Here's your like, badge. Here's this. your shades. You're booked. I <laughs> But I gotta definitely say there's something like when you do it at trade shows and stuff, there's like a certain hook you can go for too. Like if you can get like a small group to get around it at the same time, like instead of one at a time, and then they start commiserating with their skills, like, nah man, the trick is you gotta do this thing right here. This is how you do the best. And the other guy's like, Whoa, I didn't know that. And the other friend was like, he's just leading you wrong. Let me tell you the real way to win. And then you get <laughs> it's like weird back and forth for like that's I will say like for all the trade shows I've ever done, like the strangest but most effective scenarios have always been um, either like a, a time challenge or a score attack, something that has people constantly wanting to beat other players that try your game so that eventually you'll get them all hanging around just watching for the guy to beat their previous goes like, oh, no, that ain't going to stand. Get out of the way. <laughs> and then, of course, everybody who's trying to beat the top dog are going to be talking together to figure out what's the trick. What is he doing that we're not? It's a. Uh, and that's honestly exactly how it plays out. It ends up being really effective, not just to get everybody engaged, but also just to push your game. Because quite frankly, at that point, you're just kind of kicking back and watching everybody make scores that you were not expecting them to pull off when you showed up that day. Yeah, cool. I am curious another thing. Like, so outside of the rhythm genre, what are some other games that you'd say you've liked over the years that really just kind of piqued your interest? Mm, yeah. I think that, you know, I like uh, RPGs and I get I dive into them and I love I love great storytelling. Um, I know I have great respect for the people that take the time to Google a great story uh, and with characters that you end up caring about that aren't just like, you know, wooden stereotypes and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I, I know that takes an incredible amount of time and incredible amount of uh, people to, to, to uh, manifest, I guess, aside from, you know, big AAA games and games with great stories. Um, a lot of the stuff that uh, uh, Mizuguchi-san does, like Res and uh, Tetris Effect and things like that, mm. those kind of games where they're also, I mean, it's its a kind of a rhythm game, but it's also an action game, and it's also more than it's an experience, you know, they, when they were trying to use, like, the vibration in a way that, that was novel and, and find ways to get multimodal kind of experience happening uh, in the title. That was really cool and really powerful for me. Hmm. Tetris Effect in VR is pretty trippy. Yeah, yeah. 
that just a fact was a major shock to me in general by virtue of the fact that they was like, hey, we're going to make this new game. Yay, it's Tetris. Why? And then they released it. <laughs> and you're like, I had no, I did not expect them to take something as, you know, done as Tetris. Because when I say done, I don't mean like it's like bad. I mean, just like Tet- everyone knows Tetris. It's, there's yeah. but so much you can do with the concept. But then they took it and made it euphoric. <laughs> beyond what it already was capable of in a way that it kind of revo- it revived it really like it's a it's a fantastic product so i i like the sound of that too the fact that you're a, you're a big fan of that and also just games that kind of put you in a nice zen state yeah definitely exactly so. and that that's something that i wanted to achieve uh with hexagroup which is why one of the reasons why we added the freestyle mode uh where there are there is no game over and you can focus only on the music and you control when you have the tapping or the the audio effects and which instruments you want to use, you can build your custom packs. You can even turn off the, the game sound effects in the crowd. And then you just have a music performance machine that you can sit in the dark and then look at the lights flash while you, you play endlessly. Yeah. Actually, that may be worth asking, too, because as you already heard from earlier in the call, both Joe and I have been sucking royally at this game thus far. But we're going to get <laughs> hey, better. I'm, I and haven't we're been ho- sucking royally. <laughs> <laughs> He's like a I have been. Gesturely. I've gesturely. Moderately, like, we're going to- moderate suckage on my end. <laughs> not not complete. But we will get better is the important part. And when we do, one thing that's been I've been wondering about, and I'm wondering if you can answer that, is like when you pick a track in the game, they always have that option early. It's like it says like basic pack, like techno basic or trance right. basic. Do you unlock other like sound styles that can be used instead of the bass one that you're playing on these levels when you start them? Yeah. So every time that you clear a genre, you gain access to modify it. Uh, so if you've beaten house, then if you went back and played house again, the next time you can duplicate the basic and then that is like a copy. And then you can go into the basic and you can change it. And that involves changing both the order of the sounds. If you want to put them to different mappings that work for you, but we also give you uh, 50% more sounds. So there's an additional 16 that you haven't heard yet at all. And then you can map those, uh, in addition to your favorite ones in the previous and do that, you know, up to five times for each, each pack. And then you're making your own basically custom templates uh, for the song. So then you can hear more different house and that's house that's just built around the kind of sounds that you want. Okay, Jeez, that makes this a lot game of sense. is so much deeper than I even thought. Good Lord. What else is hidden in this game? Like is. <laughs> Are there <laughs> is like Crash, Tetris hidden Crash in the game lockable. somewhere too or yeah, something? Yeah, no, no. But I mean, the 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 way that I design games is around like a, a three level system of player mastery. So the first level is staying alive, and then the second uh, level uh, is 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 getting uh, yes, and there yeah, and the second is <laughs> S ranks, and then the third level is style points. And the way you get style points is by using tricks. And that time, once you start unlocking tricks, then Hexagroup becomes like a skateboard game. There was a game that I really liked uh, in the 90s called Top Skater by Sega. I like a motion oh, yeah. base. Oh, yeah. Where's Chris? Like, he know, loved that game. <laughs> so you could do like, you know, nose grinds or ollies. And like you you control what tricks you do at what time. And each trick has different difficulty. And then the more tough tricks give you more points. So in Hexagroove, there's DJ tricks. And uh, you do more difficult DJ tricks and you get more style points. And you see how many tricks you can string along while still keeping an S rank and staying alive uh, in each level. I think there's 12 tricks in total, and some involve, you know, working just with the drum. Some work with, involve working with the melody, and some involve being very quick with your fingers and stuff like that. So, when you get uh, uh, better and deeper into the game, then you start adding tricks, and then the improvisation really takes off. See, this is what I like to hear. See, man, this was a good idea, Joe. I'm just going to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> Having this interview today it was a great idea. Because I'm honestly looking forward to unlocking these, these technical <laughs> maneuvers. I genuinely am. But like, whew. yeah, because the game is so, like I said, coming into it, I was like, oh, this is very unlike anything I've ever done before. I'm not familiar with this concept. And I was doing like base level okay. But as you clearly explained, base level is something that you start at, but you want to get well beyond that before you get to the point where you can like say, I'm going to call this game. Like, no, 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 there's more to this bad boy. It's just yeah. getting in tune with it and getting in touch with it. Yeah. And we, originally we had all that stuff at the beginning, but like I said, that was overwhelming to say, Hey, you've got tricks. Hey, you've got loop attributes. Hey, you've got custom packs. Hey, you've got, you know, that would just be like, I don't know what the heck is going on. So we ended up like putting those behind unlock gates to make sure that you didn't get too overloaded with too much stuff too fast. And I think that first step between 
when you first boot up the game to when you can start getting bees, I think, is the area that, that might need the most love. Um, mm-hmm. But I think if you can get to that point, then afterwards, uh, it's really going to open up for you. And there's a lot of realm for mastery. When you get to the hard levels, I mean, then you like have to juggle uh, like three or four different dimensions of the game in your mind at once. You're looking at the health meter going down your upper left-hand corner. You're eyeballing the loops. You know the attributes. And you get a feel for how long it will be until it goes green. So you'll know it'll become green before it does. And you'll anticipate that. And then you can launch that. And then you do some tricks to boost up your health a little bit to get you through the level. Um, and if you like juggling those different kinds of uh, problem spaces at once, I think you might really enjoy the game, uh, getting deeper into it. I am a man it. who juggles. I am a man who juggles. <laughs> So, that, so you basically hit me. You hit, you hit a good spot there with me on there. Like I'm a big sucker for games where it's like, okay, you got to manage multiple facets of com- of gameplay or slash combat at one time. It's not yep. just mash X to win. Yeah. So I am interested. I am. Yes. But what do you think, Cole? Do you think this is going to take you back, ready to go, ready to <laughs> let your daughter push you to the extra level? <laughs> Look, she can play it until her fingers fall off, but I am willing to accept that I don't have a musical bone in my body. <laughs> <laughs> well, there some is. things just have to be what they are. <laughs> but if you, but if you've un- if you've cleared the first level, then you have, you've unlocked multiplayer. So I you can have play not- with you. I have not cleared the first okay. level. <laughs> if well, if your daughter if your daughter can clear the first level, then you can unlock the player. There it is. And then when we have multiplayer, the you birth second- a cheat code. <laughs> yeah, tell us there's about the multiplayer. A- what is the multiplayer yeah. in this game? There, there's right. up to four players. What does everybody do? Exactly. So you can have two people can be DJs. So, like, if you wanted to, if you just cared about the beats or you cared about the melodies, then you could focus on one or the other and your friend could do the other. But you share the interface. So you can't step on their toes. You can't turn off what they're turning on and vice versa. You got to pay attention to that and communicate. Um, but if you want to focus on just one aspect of the game, you can do that. Um, and then if you uh, want to experience a different part of the game, there's a role we have called super fans. So the, other than two DJs, you can have two super fans. And super fans are for people that are a little intimidated at first, or they want to experience the visuals more, or just, you know, they want, they want to participate, but they don't want to be at the forefront. So you can launch confetti cannons. Um, you can give power-ups, uh, like <laughs> health items, to the main DJ. If they're, like, in trouble, if they're losing, you can, like, spin the wheel, uh, spin the analog stick to recharge them. And uh, you can also time different kinds of bombs and things like that. So you would get a soundboard to cheer along for them. So you can participate musically, but it, the, the pressure to beat the level is not entirely on you. See, Cole, you can contribute. Exactly. I can just hear her yelling at me already that I'm fucking up the combo. <laughs> no, or you can hear her yelling, Mom, launch the confetti cannons. You're like, aye, aye, dear. The one thing I could do effectively is launch confetti cannons. <laughs> and let's be honest here. If, if more people were effective at launching confetti cannons, the world would be a better place. It would. Right. So, uh, just saying, just saying. <laughs> so, David, how do you see your game creating world peace through confetti cannons? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, music, music can solve everything, right? I don't know if you guys have ever seen like any of the Bill and Ted movies. I have I not seen the new one. one. Yeah, but you've seen the original, so you oh, remember yeah. like how, how their goal their goal was to like save the universe through uh, rock and roll and unite all the planets and races and everything. So, mm-hmm. I'm a believer in that. I'm a believer that great music can bring people together and. Uh, we can form a better union uh, through music. <laughs> you're here to that. I mean, honestly, you know, I'm sure we've all even had like just general associations that were go where it's like, uh, I don't see eye to eye with you on many things, but let me tell you something at this concert with this beer or that beer, everything's great. <laughs> music is playing. It just feels right. It just feels good. Music connects hearts. Don't agree with you on a lot of things, but we both hate Nickelback. <laughs> hey, even Nickelback, I have a weird, like, music in itself is just a strange beast in that, you know, like, I'm sure you've met the person who's like, I hate pop music, right? But at the same time, by the science of music, everyone likes pop. Like, it's a, I almost think for a person to not at least instinctively like it, not necessarily cue it up in the radio, but to not like pop would just be like, something's missing. And you know, when I say that, I mean, just like it has that progression. Are you calling of, me a sociopath? Yes. I, I well, Joseph. Very no. accurate. <laughs> <laughs> but like, there's something to it. Like, there's been songs that back in the day, I was like, I don't want this song. This song is terrible. Blah, blah, blah. But if I'm at, say, like a grocery store or the dentist's office and it comes up on the Muzak player, 
I'm going to sit there with a grumpy face still tapping my foot because it's still doing what it does, which is get that infectious loop in your head. Muzak version of Sixpence None the Richer. <laughs> uh, hey, it might be out there. Kiss me. <laughs> <laughs> like, boys, what is your take on that, actually, David? Like, the concept of, like, you know, music kind of having, like, it's specifically pop music, I guess, having that sort of universal appeal despite actual liking of it. Well, I think definitely. I mean, that's why it's it's pop, right? It's popular because it's it's you know it's the kind of melodies and beats that can connect with the most people uh, and build uh, the deepest kind of connections that that most people can get into. So I I completely understand that, and I think that you know being a snob about about one kind of music or another is not is not helping things. I think just keeping an open mind and you like music and I love music and let's just love the fact that we both love music and then take it from there and we can learn a lot about ourselves and each other in the process. Here, here to that. Here, here to that. <laughs> Except country music. That can fuck off. <laughs> I, honestly, I used to be that person. I used to be. And then something happened one day when I heard a country track. It wasn't by choice. It was like someone was like, oh, by oh, I have control of the dog. I like how he had know, to preface point. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, that's because that's the truth. Like, I was you know, tied I down. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, like, it's more like, you know, you know, how it is. like if you have a choice to listen to something all the time, you're almost never going to go towards the thing that you already told yourself you don't like. But in this instance, someone else had control of the dial. They picked the tune. And I was like, you know, this sounds better than I thought. And it doesn't hit the stereotypical notes I used to think it did. This is country that I like. And then I switched my position to every genre has something you like. You just haven't heard it yet. Mm. Because Definitely. honestly. And then yeah. there's country. <laughs> <laughs> Cole, if anyone is legally obligated to like country, it's you. With your I accent. Country music. You, know you are legally means, required. No. Nope. Every nope. episode leading, you got to get a different country rendition of like the SML theme <laughs> until <laughs> one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Need no someone to do a, a, a country western version of our theme song for the show. That would be. <gasps> we've had so many rock themes. We need to change it up. We need something different. Yeah, see? <laughs> and Cole will be like, you know, I wasn't all about it before, but now. No, the no, theme no, this CG. country is really good. I'm really <laughs> digging this country, country theme cares. song. <laughs> I'm hanging up the call now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Oh. We love so, David, you've made a lot of rhythm games over the years. Have you played a lot of rhythm games? What What are some of your favorites over the years? Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Uh yeah, I mean, I've gone through my, I've gone through the phases that like everyone has, I think, with, uh, I had my dance, dance revolution phase and <laughs> my taiko no tatsujin, my drum master phase and, and things like that. It's really hard, hard to pick a favorite. Um, I think lots of people are doing really interesting with this, with uh, the genre now. And you see rhythm games working their way into like action games, like action games that have a strong rhythm component, uh, is, is starting to become more popular too. Um, so that's, that's great. Uh, I think No Straight Roads was released just this week, actually the same the same week as we did uh, on Xbox. And um, that's another game where they're taking trying to take musical principles and put it into an action game where the game is somewhat rhythm and somewhat action. And I think that's fantastic. I'm really happy for them. I have not played No Straight Roads yet. I've I've heard it's really good, but it's pricey. Forty bucks is is expensive for me. I don't have that for No Straight Roads right now. Oh, I yeah. have it in a bag right now. I just gotta wait and start it. <laughs> It's just <laughs> like he you said. Have it, it, you know, I do. It hit all the notes for Purnell. It's like, you know, it's pretty much what he described was what sold me. It was like action game with a rhythm based, you know, infusion. And of course, the characters look ridiculously cartoonish, like something on a cartoon network. I was sold on all those things. So just a mm. matter of taking that time and getting it started. Clearly, yeah, if a, I stopped a, buying rock band songs for a couple of months, I could afford other games, but. You you put like three of their kids through college at this point. You can I take did. a break. I, I have supported harmonics way too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. In my yeah, it's, 2700 it's tough. You bring up You bring That's up it. a good point, which I think as a consumer, it's really tough these days, because there's so many great games. You have so many options and, mm -hmm. and making games is as the democracy of making games. Now with, you know, these engines like unreal and unity and, and lots of tools and tutorials like anybody can make games, like anybody can make music and anybody can take pictures and put stuff up on Instagram and become famous that way. So 
as consumers, we have a hard time not being, uh, I guess, kind of like, um, how do you say, becoming blasé just to do with, with and, and taking it for granted, the, the amount of content that we have. But of course, our wallets only have so much money. I mean, more importantly, we only have so much time on the clock. And, and it gets honest, really hard for you guys to choose like when, to when, what honest, games to play with. And to be honest, like you hit the nail on the head, like in a sense where you say like, you know, like it's hard to pick and choose because of the sheer volume and quality out there. And yet somehow what I've come to notice over the years of, you know, social media conversations is that people, as a result, their their expectations of what makes something good has shifted. Because very few people get exposed to something that one can construe as being really bad. Um, like in the old NES days, when there were few games to choose from, and you likely were getting games based on what your parents could afford from the bargain bin, um, <laughs> you sometimes stumbled across a game you didn't expect to find that was genuinely probably poorly built from the ground up. Maybe a few missteps were taken, but as a result, the game just didn't do well as a result. And you could say, this is a bad game. I wish I got something else. But now, someone will get a game that, I don't know, maybe isn't constantly running at 60 frames per second. Maybe it trips down to 45 sometimes. And otherwise, the game runs fine. And the narrative may not be the to write home about, but it's serviceable and the game plays good. And you'll get cast coming out saying, this is the worst game I've ever played in my life. This should have this should have baked longer. They should fire everybody in that studio. And you're like, w- w- or did we play the same game? <laughs> yeah. This this game is quite fine to me. I don't know what your gripe is. Like, it's one thing to say, you know, I've played better than this, such as then and then. It's another thing to go, this game sucks. Because you I can't suck, recall. Pernell. How about that? In your face. <laughs> 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 but like, That's I, the I kind can't of love recall. we have on this show. It's true. It's true. It's true. Like, I mean, because deep down, I think that was, I think doing reviews was the trade off there, too. Like, getting exposed to tons of games, like left and right, like, as opposed to having to pick and choose individual games, it becomes a matter of, okay, this game, I think, I mean, I think I've, I've been working with this site since like nine, like 2016 or so. And in that time, I may well have reviewed maybe five games that I was like, this is just a bad game. Like, I can't. I can't recommend this to anybody yeah. <laughs> like five times. And even then I can explain the whys, but it just goes to show you that for all the games I reviewed and I reviewed a lot. <laughs> I can only think of like five that were just like, Nope, no, no dice. So it's just, becomes and this a matter is of one like, of, no, that would be nonsense. awful. <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> would be nonsense. So awful. This, <laughs> this game is legit. Make it six. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. No. No, you like David. <laughs> I have no idea where you're going with this, Pernell. I really don't. <laughs> it's just a general rant based I on just kind of like zoned out and was looking at the light and I was I like, oh, Pernell was talking. <laughs> this is the SML podcast, David. Everybody gets cold blooded. And I'm just like, cold blooded. Cold blooded. Yeah. Yeah. Cold blooded. <laughs> that does lead to a good question. With so many games out nowadays, why should people go with Hexagroove? What what sets your game apart? Why should people drop the 30 bucks on Hexagroove? So for me, Hexagroove is a game unlike any other. And of course, lots of people say that. But I really think we've set a new standard in terms of uh, pulling away from rhythm and what's possible and pulling away from what an RTS is. So the experience uh, is unlike any other. And if you're looking for something that uh, allows you to express yourself musically, and maybe you've had thoughts about it, but have failed at that, I think I can recommend this game uh, because it's on rails. It's not going to sound terrible. You don't have to worry about uh, being off the beat and the music being off key and stuff like that. And secondly, like we talked about before, um, the, the there's a lot of depth in here. So if you like juggling those things in your mind, if you like combining elements of action and strategy at the same time, then I think we, we have that in spades. And there's a lot of depth to becoming Hexamaster Supreme, which is the top title we have in the game. If you can, you can, you can put together enough tricks in a row, you can, you can pull that one off. I don't think I will ever be Hexamaster Supreme. Ah, uh, you can get to be Hexamaster I'm gonna Supreme. Try. There's multiple. There's multiple ways to get there. The thing about this game is, there's no one way to get an S rank, and there's no one way to get lots of style points. There's you just many need to different find strategies. Somebody that can do it for you. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah you have one. A music inclined daughter or something <laughs> that could work too. Well, I may not get Hexa Master Supreme, but I'm gunning for at least Hexa Master with cheese. I'm okay with that standpoint. 
Oh my God. <laughs> I, I do want to ask one more thing. Cause I just wanted to think of it cause I've been thinking about it, but I never quite checked in game for it proper. The beach ball bouncing mini game. Is that mm. a thing that you do for just for general fun? Or is there like some element to your score that factors in that too? So, uh, I guess at risk of perjuring myself, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't actually affect the S rank at all. So we track the, the maximum number of, of, uh, contiguous combos you get. So, you know, it says mm-hmm. like bounce, you can counts up. So we cat, we track the highest that you get and there's an achievement tied to it too. If you're an achievement hunter. So please go after that one. Yeah. 75. Uh, oh my Lord. <laughs> I got 122. Really? Okay, go. Yeah, the problem is I, can't, I always. I'm not. The problem is I keep dying on the stage before it's over. <laughs> but I have yeah, gotten so over a hundred stage. Yeah, yeah, you got to get 75 and clear the stage. Yeah, but the reason we put that in there is because originally when I designed the game, I really wanted it to be about the music making and the strategy. And in music, sometimes you don't. You're not always touching the strings. You're not always changing the track. You just have to let it flow sometimes, and that's when you just enjoy the music for what it is. And you look at the crowd and enjoy their experience. But in Hexagroove, it, because it's a game, some people didn't, uh, th- that doesn't speak to them. So we added in something because they were like fidgeting. Like I had some players in user testing, they were like moving the stick back and forth, even though they couldn't do anything. So they weren't pushing any buttons, but they were like rocking the stick back and forth slowly to the beat, you know, like just because they wanted something to do until uh, one of the blue loops became green. And at that point, like, yeah, we need something in here. We need, we need some kind of like a physical visceral interaction so we added in what we call the rhythm ball which is the beach ball um and you can juggle it and it's only out when there's no moves left on the board so if you think about hexagroup it's like a chess chess board or whatever when there's no valid moves left everything is blue that's when it comes out and it goes away automatically as soon as something becomes green and there's a chance for you to go again and that um, makes sense so it's basically the equivalent of like the dj on the stage pumping his fist up while yeah, everybody's getting down exactly Exactly. Make and if you don't noise. like it, if you don't like it, you can turn it off completely from the settings as well. Like personally, to me, it irritates me, um, especially in the hard difficulty settings where I want to focus on beating the game and the energy and, and changing the music and it distracts me. So if you don't like it, you can turn it off completely. But if you do like it, leave it on, go for it and then get 120, 150. That's fantastic. I would love to see how many bounces you guys can get. So send me a screenshot on Twitter or something like that. And, and like 30 it, something. <laughs> <laughs> Give it time, Joe. You'll be surprising it yourself yeah. in time. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just the backbeat, and it helps to listen to it more than look at it. I think I need to play with headphones because I have a little bit of a delay coming from the TV with how everything's run. Yeah. So I, yeah, the latency might make it worse. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, I will say it's also worth noting that if you get good at the beats ball, you only have to wait for the countdown to start using it. You can get it in there from the first drop. That's true. That's true. Duke, 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 <laughs> bam, beach ball. Like it's, it's a good time. Oh, my Lord. But I, can, but I can definitely say without a doubt here, and this is before even getting to the crazy loop stuff, like you came up with a good product here. And I mean, it ties back to that thing I said earlier, but these days with every genre under the sun being milked by everybody, because nothing's truly feels original anymore, just by virtue of how many games are produced and made at a time. I think you actually did a great job of pulling that off with this game. I have not played anything that does this. Thank and you. that speaks volumes. Yeah, it's incredibly unique. It's really fun. Uh, it's available now on Xbox. Tell us how how much is it? Uh, you said it's on Xbox. It's on Switch as well. Uh, any other platforms? Any other plans for PlayStation maybe? Uh, no, no plans for other platforms right now. We're going to see how the Xbox version uh, goes because, of course, it takes us some resources to do a port uh, every time. It's thirty dollars, like you said, uh, in the states, thirty-five euros in Europe, and because it's Xbox, it's available all over the world. And I think like two hundred and forty markets or something like that, which wow. is which is crazy. Yeah, a lot of people get to play this one. Yeah, definitely. And we have it localized for Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. So if you um, are stronger in Asian language than uh, than English, then that's we got support for you in that area too. Nice. So well, it may be next month, but we can't just go yet, Joe. We got the big penultimate question for him. Let, let's hear it, Pernell. What is next for your studio after Hexa Group? What do you think is on, on your mind for the next product? Mm, well, we're working on something now. I can't tell you too much, but I will tell you that this year I've been playing um, uh, Into the Breach a lot. Oh, yes. I'm glad you said that because I was like, he's talking about tactical DJ work. Maybe he'll make a strategy game that does yeah. more with music, but it's more strategy. Yeah. Don't you'll forget. Make- don't forget that we're musicians. But yeah, but we, I have been playing um, some turn based strategy games this year, too. 
Mm-hmm. Mm, the tease. I'm looking forward to whatever the heck's coming out of that mill. <laughs> well, we I ha- already know I'm going to be bad at it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Cole. <laughs> what, what, what kind of game do you want, Cole? What, what can I do? What can we do uh, next? Can I have a point and click? <laughs> <laughs> point and click, visual novel, tap, dating tap, elements tap with the hexagon and wind, something like that. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I love to find them. Types of people. <laughs> <laughs> that could be an interesting thing, though, when you think about it. You take a point-and-click adventure game where a puzzle might have multiple clues attributed to it, and as you start linking the clues together, you alter the way the music is playing during the sequence of which you're using all the clues. Yeah. Yeah, I hope you wrote that down on a post-it note. That's our one good idea. Yeah. We have one good idea. Every interview, that was it, and we're done for. No. Hey, he just said he was playing into the breach. <laughs> That's <so> good idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord well i know we've been chatting for quite a while is there anything you wanted to cover that we didn't bring up at all mm, no i don't think there's much more to say about hexagroove today although i really like talking with you guys um are you do you guys talk about games industry stuff in general or do you usually focus on like one particular game when you do no, we, we cover everything yeah well maybe sometime we could talk about like you know what the cost of making games or perceived value and things like that because i would love to hear your guys opinions on that and i can talk from a developer perspective or maybe we could take it another time oh, that would be amazing Great yeah conversation. that would be pretty cool yeah yeah uh cool. pick a day pick a time let's let's schedule something let's make something happen pernell will have to get you involved in that one as well uh yeah that sounds like a, a really fun conversation and it'd be really cool to hear your side of things yeah definitely great it's been lot, lots of fun talking with you guys today thank you so much for having me Thanks for coming on. Yeah, it thank you so pleasure. much for coming on. It's been a blast having you on. Uh, one more time, give us the rundown about the game, where it is, how much is it, how can people keep in touch with you. Uh, give us all the details, all the information. One more time. Yeah, no problem. So my name is David Ventura. Um, you can find me on Twitter, at Game Dev Ventura. Uh, our company is Ichigo Ichie, which means one chance in a lifetime in Japanese. And we're talking about our game, Hexagroove Tactical DJ, which is now on Xbox One and Switch. Uh, for $30. And we have a free demo on both those platforms if you want to dip your toes in and try things out. You can find us on uh, Twitter. We're most active there, but we also have uh, Facebook and Instagram. Just search for Hexagroove, uh, and I'm sure we'll come pop right up. Awesome. All right. Well, David, it has been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, everybody else, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to be back with some more show. The party cast is going to be here. Pernell, you're sticking around. Cole, you're sticking around. God uh, damn it. <laughs> yeah, I know. You you got to put up with it. Sucks to be you. <laughs> Sucks to be you too, Pernell. We're all hey, in this I'm together. All right with it. Let's get it in. <laughs> but yeah, we're going to take a quick break. We will be back with more show. David, do you have any final words to end the interview? Peace. <laughs> be safe. Be healthy, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Another thanks to David at Ichigo Ichie for hanging out with us and chatting. Cole and Purnell are going to be here in a little bit. Uh, they they stepped out. They went for cigarettes, I think they told me. Uh, <laughs> Tim, you're here. How are you doing? Oh, man. I'm just fucking something. I don't know what. <laughs> man, I am tired. It's been a... What is dinging? Go away. Okay. Dinging is gone. I don't know what's dinging. No, it was Facebook. It was still open in the background somewhere. Oh, yay. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, just a busy week of work. It was an early morning today. It was a long day yesterday. So, yeah, 
So you just I'm want to very, get this over and done with, don't you? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I got I got a big game to review, so I do have some <laughs> big game to play. Um, but yeah, I fucking uh, just to follow up on my saga briefly of fucking uh, those little Super Mario blind bag Lego things. Oh no! Oh yeah! Oh, oh no! It's a, oh big! Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> Fucking like so, I I had a I had some uh, Best Buy uh, you know reward certificate from you know buying a TV there, and those points added up, and then it was like oh well you know that thing expires in like a month and a half, and I'm like oh I know I'll get some more of those blind bag things, and like so in the first round we got two urchins, two bloopers, and two bombs. I could only get five because there was a limit of five purchase on Best Buy, and I had a $25 thing. So it almost worked out perfectly. It was real dumb. I won't get into it. Um, <laughs> but of the five, I got two bloopers, two bob oh, and then one, one cheap, cheap. I was so mad. My kid loves it. He doesn't, he doesn't really – he's like a little bummed, but he still thinks it's great, and he wants to build them and whatever. But I'm just sitting there like, this is – fucking bullshit <laughs> you like, sons of get, bitches to get fucking 11 of them and eight of them are two sets i mean unless those are like super overstock i mean it might it's either a a horrible coincidence or it's b that those two are like hyper common no. amongst them how many and, like, different I, ones are there there's 10 oh and God. i know i now have four different ones out of 11 packs i'm just like that is that is really bad yeah those are shit odds those are be- terrible blind box odds. let me tell you okay this is gonna go on i just went <laughs> full pernell tangent here so there was a um overwatch or yeah blizzard has done a couple sets of their overwatch uh tiny but deadly figures uh which when i i was more into overwatch like a year and a half ago and i got a couple of them and I'm trying I'm trying to think how I made this connection because I think I might have gotten one at like some point beforehand. And then I got I got a few more and I, I got some very specific doubles that made me figure out that the cases were actually packed in a very specific way. And oh, long story short, I figured that out and I was able to buy all of them like clean. Wow. Clean. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely a roll of the dice, but I was fucking right. Like from that point, like once I really I think I had two doubles out of the whole set. And then I was like, OK, I think it's this and I'm just going to roll the dice. And I was 100 percent correct. And I got all of them, including the fucking chase figure, which I then sold, <laughs> paid off the whole dumbass. Investment. What was special about the chase variant? Uh, it was uh, May. uh and she, it was uh, made of an, an ice blue plastic, so it was kind of translucent. Mm. Yeah. And I was like, ah, I don't need this. I got regular May back here somewhere. They're all behind me on this table. Like the oh, clear I'm- pop figures they have. I have a, a Master Chief that's clear see-through for yeah. his tactical camouflage. And then I have the John Cena, you can't see oh, me, clear God. one. <laughs> That's actually that's funny. That's worth yeah, like so fifty I, bucks now. I'm surprised. Yeah, some some pops are very expensive. But yeah, I went pretty ham on. I got a ton of those little Overwatch figures. I think it all started when I was collecting like drag. The, there was a series of Dragon Quest monster blind box figures like that. I would find when I would go to anime cons, and this was like back in like oh four oh five, and like every one I went to, like somebody selling blind boxes had them, and I was like buying some every single time for like a year and. I got a lot of those. I love those. Were those the slime keychains or was that a different one? I have some slime keychains. Yes, that was a different one. They've, I mean, there's been a ton of Dragon Quest blind box shit. Yeah. Specifically, this one set of monsters I thought was really, really good. It was like all Dragon Quest eight stuff. So that was very good. I've gotten some ultimate muscle. Got a couple ultimate muscle blind boxes. One year at Otakon. Um, it's pretty great. Some Godzilla. All kinds of shit. So They're you like your blind weird. boxes. You, you're, I do. You're a risk taker. I do, but it, but also it's like I have to, you know, I have to. I, I got to pick it up. I got to look at it. I got to like see what all the possibilities are and kind of decide like, is it worth it? Like, will it? What are the chances of me being happy with this? No. Yeah. Um, and and if it's good, so I, I don't go ham that often. But when I when I do go ham, I go pretty fucking ham. And I and I obviously <laughs> I clearly went ham on these Mario things and they, they have bitten me in the ass thus far. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll run a contest in the near future to win 
win Tim's Legos because boy, do I have fucking extras. Oh Jesus! <laughs> a a we'll see. Oh my god! I certainly don't need four of each. It's fucking bullshit. I mean, I don't know whether they just want you to. I don't know how the actual game of it works. Whether it's like, oh yeah, if you have a bunch of bloopers, what a water level you have going on there. Not much fun if you're a blind bag connoisseur, but I guess you can make bob bomb battlefield or some no shit, and that's fun. <laughs> or fodder enemies. I don't know. Whatever. It's too many. My kid's happy, but I don't know. I'll have like some. I, I brought two of them down here. I'll probably take two of them to work, and then there will still be mo- four of them upstairs. <laughs> it's like, oh my god! As long as I don't see them all in the same, like I just I have to get them away from each other. I can't see all eight of them in the same place at the same time. Just it's start just a collection on top of the mantle. Yeah, I mean, it, at a certain point, it gets funny. Uh, there was a I certain have 48 run of, bombs. <laughs> there was a certain run of like Lego Lego does minifigure blind bags, which are awesome. And I don't I don't go as hard on anymore because I got way too many of them and I don't know where to put them all. But they did one that was like a, a monster Halloween theme that I got quite a few of. But I got three of the same one, which was like this plant monster guy. And I just think it's funny to have three of them um, also have dupes of a dude in a hot dog costume. That was not <laughs> Halloween related. But again, that was funny. So that's cool. So sometimes I don't mind, but right now I mind. Let's talk about a game. <laughs> <laughs> you ready to dive into this? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I've been really <laughs> not thought about this game in two days. It's going to be flying in off the top of my head here. Let's go. Let's All go. Right, well, first game to talk about tonight is called Pathfinder Kingmaker Definitive Edition, developed by Owlcat Games, published by Deep Silver, released August 18th on Xbox One and PS4 for forty nine ninety nine. Pathfinder Kingmaker Definitive Edition is the ultimate single-player RPG experience based on the acclaimed Pathfinder series. Explore and conquer with your party the stolen lands of Galarian? Hope I said that right. A world rich with history, mystery, it's con- not a glaring mistake if it is. Uh, <laughs> God damn you. A world rich with history, mystery, and conflict featuring real-time combat or optional turn-based fights. Tim, Yay. tell us about Pathfinder Kingmaker. Yay! I like it when uh, you bring these computer RPGs over to consoles and think, hey, we need to include some options because it's on console and not just... Let it fly. Much like I talked about when I reviewed uh, Pillars of Eternity 2 uh, back in February, January, you know, a fucking lifetime ago in 2020. Um, was that really this year? That was really this year. That was that, I think that was the first game I reviewed this year. It was oh. definitely pre-COVID. Um, yeah, it was like I was... <laughs> it felt like I reviewed that game both, like, way more recently and, like, eight years ago. Um, but, yeah. So... They have this is this is a game where on PC it is one of those overhead uh, RPG deals, much like Divinity: Original Sin, much like uh, uh, Pillars of Eternity, much like your your Wasteland slash Fallout's. Uh, your you know it, it's one of those games um, brought over here to consoles, and yeah, for, first and foremost, usually on the PC they have a th- you know. It, it's easier for you to kind of like uh, direct your characters like mid battle and, and use the AI and kind of control things. But on a console, you, you have a, a game pad. Um, so they, yeah, they do have a straight up turn based mode that gives you an initiative order. Um, so you can move your characters where you want them and, and have them attack what you want them one by one. Um, and you could switch back and forth between the, the two styles at any time. I, might be misspeaking when I say I think you had to commit to one in Pillars of Trinity 2. Here you can literally change at the click of the right stick. Um, so if you're just fighting a bunch of fodder enemies, you know, your your poisonous toads, your creepy centipedes, you can just be like, ah, fuck it, auto battle. But if you're in a larger battle and you want to move characters around and position your spells, then you can, okay, I'm going to switch to turn base. I'm going get to a, get a little more in here. And you can do it with just a click of the stick. Just a click of the stick. Uh, so that's pretty great. Um... Yeah, the the character creator, like many of these games, is fucking overwhelming. Uh, <laughs> my God, it really do, is. It really is, and that. But it's just like uh, you really. Uh, you have to, uh, it's like cause I just there's so many options, and, and it's intended. Despite the the mass of this game, which is fucking enormous, they want you to uh, you know they're they're expecting you to replay it, try out different styles, different character types, different classes, uh, etc. Um, 
so you you know you're obviously not gonna be able to see do everything your first time through uh, they do have like prefab characters uh just just pre-built so you don't have to get in the weeds uh you can step into the weeds and at which point you're picking your your race and your class and your subclass of which there are you know each class has four subclasses um each class also also has uh, on top of the the entirely pre-built characters you can uh they're, they will have an auto build option with certain subclasses, kind of like generally the main one, the first one it presents you, where the game will just like level you up automatically so you don't have to worry about taking this, that, and the other thing. It will actually guide you along the way, which I appreciate being there. Um, when my wife was playing, that's what she went with. And I was, I was like asking her what she was leveling and what she was doing. And she was like, uh, eh, it's just doing it for me. <laughs> like, okay, well, that's cool. Whatever. Um, I could see her saying that too. Yeah, it d- does not offer that for for every single subclass, but I think you know when you're getting into the other subclasses, things are getting more advanced. Um, uh, your characters, you are choosing your alignment, which may be restricted depending on your class. Um, there's some other. There's like uh, I, there's a lot. There's a lot in the character creator, like picking out lots of different things, different skills, different feats. Like it could be really overwhelming. Um, so, I mean, you, you can get as, as deep in them weeds as you want. Um, the way the alignment system plays out, so it has, like, the, the D&D uh, alignment system, which you may remember from memes, um, which is, like, lawful good and chaotic good and neutral good, and then the neutrals and the chaotics and the evils and, and all that stuff. Um, the way that impacts gameplay is when it comes up in dialogue options, when you are... You know, talking to characters, conversing, uh, perhaps trying to persuade them to do one thing or another. Uh, you will have options that will be available depending upon your alignment and some that may be grayed out. Uh, like some are only available if you are evil. Um, so it's kind of like an inverse of like the old Kodor, like Mass Effect style where it's like, oh, if I want to be more evil, I will pick the evil choices. But no, you are picking an alignment for your character and you have to play within that role, um, which is how, you know, D and D is generally built to work, but um, video games you 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 might be kind of used to being able to fly off the handle any any time you want no. uh, when it strikes you. But yeah, not not as not as much here. But that's fine. It's cool. Um, they're kind of the intro to the game is the setup for the the whole thing here is you are at this mansion. Uh, you've been called by this lord. Uh, who is like, hey, I need some people to go in and take over this kind of unsettled bad land, uh, the, the stolen lands, as it's called. And then while you are there, the castle comes under attack by this mysterious other force, uh, which kind of, this will act as your your intro. It will, uh, you know, roll a few character, a lot of the other characters into your party so you can check them out. Uh, you get familiar with making checks. Um because the game makes like if there's a trap on the floor you it makes a check to disable it if there's like some rubble to clear there's an athletics check it has uh the thing where there will be like na- narrative pieces i guess where i'll say uh the, the first one they introduce where it's like they're the 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 place is on fucking fire and there's like a room that's going to collapse and you have to make your way through it to pursue the bad guys and it's like okay well what do you want to do? Do you, are you, are, do you like, do you take it slow? Do you take it fast? Do you try to do this, try to do this? There's various checks involved and depending on what you do, it can play out a certain way. Um, and that's not strictly happening. Like from the overhead perspective, moving your characters around, it cuts to like a, a hand, uh, hand drawn sort of deal. And it's more text based. Um, again, like something will be familiar. I think to, to most people in playing these games. Um, and yeah, once you, once you get to the end of that, uh, an event happens and uh, you, you are assigned some party members depending on that. And you set out into the world um, and you set out into the world onto this big map, uh, which you will start clicking around and exploring and finding things. And, you, you know, your ultimate goal is to go to said stolen lands and knock off this dude called the Stag Lord. Stag Lord. <laughs> uh, but there's some other quests along the way to, again, kind of help you cut your teeth. Like, it, there's a I kind of emphasize enough, like even more so than like other games I play in this genre. There's just a, like a lot going on uh, in this game and places you can go and things you can do. And there's like a time limit and in, into what you need to do before you get to this to and how long you have to, you know, overthrow the stolen lands to beat that stag lord into the ground. Um, 
so yeah, there's a map like time passes as you're moving around and doing things and completing quests. So there, it, it factors that in. Oh um, no, a sense of urgency. I can't just do every side yeah, quest at my leisure. <laughs> yes, you. That is yeah. That is this. Um. Uh. So yeah, but eventually you get up there, you overthrow the stag lord. Spoiler. Um. Uh. And then you become you. You are in charge of these stolen lands and suddenly this whole like kingdom sim shit gets bolted onto the game like so beyond just being like your, your traditional like turn based or, or what have you overhead dungeon crawler rpg there's now this whole like n- other management piece thrown in where you are lord of these lands you are assigning your party members to like different advisory roles uh you know you are you know holding court and like people are coming in to, would, to talk to you with their bullshit um, and their problems, same thing. Uh, and you have to deal with all that all while, you know, also going out and questing and, and going out and doing all that stuff. And, and it's a lot. Uh, it is a lot. This might not be a good place to start for someone just looking to cut their teeth on this genre, just because it is so overwhelming. Overwhelming. Yeah. Um, that doesn't make it bad per se by any means, but it was just like, man, there is a lot going on here. I mean, there is a ton of game here. Like I, I played for hours and hours and barely scratched the surface. Like the estimated time to be is like, like over a hundred hours or something like that. It, it's ridiculous. It's a huge game. It was probably a bit less than that. If you're just mainlining it, but who's doing that? Um, and I mean, aside from that, this is like the complete edition. So there are other, uh, you know, what would have been DLC or, or add on campaigns that are already here in the middle of the base in the base game. Um, it has tons of difficulty tweaking. So you can just, you know, laze through it on story if you just want to do that stuff. And you can also make it really, really hard. It's funny, like on normal, I think, I don't know, there there was some funny things about, like, that I was looking at, where it's like, you look at normal, like, normal difficulty, like, that should be the baseline, and everything should be, like, fine and normal, and it was already something like, enemies will only critical hit, critically hit you, like, or, or, enemy critical hits will only do, like, 60% damage, or, like, the enemy damage was already lower than it should be on normal, and I was like, wow, this, this game is mean. Um, (laughs) My biggest issue with this game as it currently stands uh, is I was playing this game on an Xbox One X and once you get up to like five, six members in your party, like that frame rate goes down a lot. Uh, Like it was really sluggish just like running around with my party like and especially like once you get into battle with like a bunch of other characters, like it was not running buttery smooth. Um, and it was like, yeah, I was just like, man, this is like definitely going pretty slow. Like, I, I feel like they they have like they have all the good like all the yeah, that's it. It's just like just kind of a performance issue. Um, and, and we all know how I feel about time on this podcast and, and things that waste it. No. Uh, yeah, my only real beef with the game, like right at this moment, is just like once you kind of get that full party and you're exploring like things slow down considerably and it, it it's a drag it drags on the game and there's also like quite a bit of loading and when you're loading in and out of an area like you know it is a a solid load <laughs> whoa there's a phrase um <laughs> so you know if you're going you know up and down floors or, or in and out of a cave trying to figure out like where you're going like it can be like like geez like just you know put down the game pick up your phone then you get out and you're kind of like running into molasses around so it's just like i hope that there is some optimization coming to to try to get this game up to speed a little um but otherwise it's it's good it is it is well adapted to the console format from just the battle system and like the menus are pretty they're easy enough to to navigate uh like a radial menu would have been good when you when you go into the pause menu but it's like a like a I guess a deck of cards. I don't think it's actually cards, but it's like laid out kind of left. It's fanned out left to right and it's fine. Um, and you, and you can, you just switch between characters when you, when you, when you go, when you want to go into their equipment or whatever. And it, and it all works decently well. Um, moving items around is, is a little bit tedious as it just is going to be, but it's, it's not too bad. Um, yeah, just, just kind of that, 
that performance issue is what's holding it back from like a full throated recommendation. Really. Yeah. Well, if they get that sorted out, fifty bucks on this one, what are you thinking? Yeah, that's it's well worth buying. It's, it's a fucking huge ass game. Uh there's so much you can do with it. Uh it plays well uh when when you're not like overloaded with characters. Um it's just it's just a bit overwhelming, I think, for players new to the genre, perhaps. Yeah, I can agree with you on that. It is it's such an intimidating game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But, all right, Tim, always a pleasure having you on. Uh, we got to jump over to our party cast now. So do you have any final words? No, I'm sure. I'm sure there will be plenty. Yeah. Pernell, I already, I already Pernell's going to have them. Pernell's going to have plenty of, plenty of, yeah. Pernell's got you. All right, moving on. It is party cast time. Cole, you're back. Pernell, you're uh-huh. back. Chris Taylor's here. How's oh. everybody doing? The future is weird. The future <laughs> is weird. <laughs> How come you sounded depends. so much more excited about Chris than me and Pernell? Because you and you Pernell have like, been here. You've yeah, like, I've had to put up with your shit for an us. hour now. You could, you could still be back. excited about Cole, it. Cole, you're, you're here. Cole, you're we're still in, kicking it. Where is it? Look. <laughs> I'm excited. Given everything that's wrong with me, the fact that I am still here is a goddamn miracle. <laughs> 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 true. Very you true. never know what I'm gonna kill over from Tuesday to Thursday. <laughs> very, very Wait. true. Hey, I'm the same way. This heart can go anytime now. <laughs> I'm almost forty. I'm obese. Shit's gonna shut down really soon. You're, so you can be OBS. <laughs> <laughs> and it'd be shutting down even sooner. Uh, yeah, count your true. blessings. You could be OBS. So let's just be honest here. OBS is in the red, and so is my cholesterol. Shout out to Dark Mika, who's also here. <laughs> oh my lord, Dark Mika! Yes, she is here. Not not on the on the phone call. No, but no. In spirit, yeah. She's. I asked her if she screen? wanted to come on, but she she was like no, and then that led to Cole being like, "Do you want me to do reviews tonight?" And I'm like, "Nah, don't worry about it." And now it's just party time, and OBS is giving me shit, and. <laughs> And I'm not going to do reviews either, so. Ah, uh, fuck. Wait, <laughs> whoa. I no, I'm just they, kidding. They if have, I, it's if the I Pernell show. That, I'm going to get way too much backlog. <laughs> there has to be a specific amount of reviews per show. And I didn't want to throw the universe off balance I by like, making there be eight games instead of nine. Hey, I like having it's, my show in threes. What? I lo- no, I thought this was five. But Tim did one. Tim did so one. So it's six. Oh, Tim, what did he do? What did he break? He he broke uh, Pathfinder Kingmaker. Oh, man, I hope he made the king. He did. Did he build him out of pathways? I don't know. Oh, it's a mystery the most deaths in SML video game reviews. <laughs> Always occurs in threes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I like my formatting in my write-up to be specific. Your three-matting. Yeah, my... <laughs> Very symmetric. Oh, no. <laughs> Root beer wants to do a review. Root beer, what, what do you want to review, Root beer? <laughs> what do all of you want to review? Some quality games. Perfect good game of game ball. I mean, now you're asking too much. Cole, I know you want to review Drake Hollow. Uh huh. That's next episode. I love me some Drake Hollow. Spoiler alert. And I want to chill. To the next episode, make another review. Moon, statement. but I already bought it. How is it? I saw you streaming it. Oh, it's real good. I I quite enjoy it. It was frustrating at first because I didn't really understand it, and then Onion Games is like, "Oh, by the way, here's the instruction book for free." I, I was like, "Oh, friend, thanks." I had a friend literally claim that the game made them feel stupid. Why? I didn't quite get. That's the thing. I didn't quite get it because the way he described the game, it sounded more like the real issue with the game. If you're coming into it, you know, with like, you know, fresh eyes is the fact that it's heavily built. And Chris can correct me if I misunderstood the friend, but it's heavily built around the idea of like waiting for the right time to be somewhere and utilizing that moment to do whatever you have to do. But if you're not waiting or if it's not the right time, you'd spend a lot of time waiting around, too. Um, Well, there's always something to do. It's kind of like. You know, there's a day and night cycle, and yeah, sometimes you have to, like, wait for something to happen, like, at, at nighttime or a certain time during the day, and you only have so much energy that you can be around, but 
the more you progress in the game, the more you can like kind of be around, like staying awake and stuff. And um, you can sleep to make like time pass as well. Um, and time does pass pretty fast, so it's one of those things. Like you kind of get into the rhythm. And the other thing is, I've played Tulip, which is by you know more or less the same people. So like that oh. also has the day and night cycle and. You know, certain things have to happen at certain times. But the game's very forgiving in terms of, like, if you didn't get it this time, you can get it next time. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it. you know, you don't have to feel too much pressure in this game because there's not, like, an overall overarching, like, time limit to do things. You just kind of, like, uh, keep going and feel the love wherever you can. <laughs> and, yes, I also love Onion games. I've got, well, all of them so far. <laughs> what are some of the other games they did? Uh, Dandy Dungeon, Legend of Brave Yamada, and Blackbird. Oh, that was them. Yeah, okay. and uh, also Blackbird, which is a Defender-style shooter, where you play the soul of a dead girl who comes back as a monstrous crow who zaps all the people that basically wronged her. Basically, you tear down all of society for letting a poor girl starve in the streets. That's my kind of game. Yeah, it's very cool. It's It's got, um, the soundtrack is opera in a fake language. Yeah, interesting huh? yeah onion games are incredible and when they go on sale like they've been going on pretty good sales lately and i recommend everybody pick them up and then if you join their newsletter um they will send you another free it's called million onion hotel and it's like a free kind of mini game on switch or on steam or uh i think it's on browser um mm. or mobile i haven't played it yet so oh. i don't know Oh, and you also get mini soundtracks for uh, Dandy Dungeon and uh, some other stuff, like wallpapers and things. So y'all should join the, the Onion newsletter. I, the, I would. This episode brought to you by Onion. <laughs> I know, that's the thing. I've never gotten a review code from them. I've only purchased their games, and yet here I am selling them. So I know. You're welcome. You're, and, um, you're just a glutton for Onions. I'm a glutton for their weird-ass awesome games, yes. <laughs> And I'm fighting with an onion as we talk about onions. So this is an oniony <laughs> scenario right now. I like that. Oh, I, like I hate it. onions so much. Like not oh, the developer, onions, just actual yeah. onions. I despise them. I'm okay with green onions. Any other onion can kiss my ass. <laughs> I like onions. Gross. Onion. <laughs> I don't like the way that popular California fast food restaurant In and Out Burger does onions. They give you a solid slice. Uh, like and they just lay it across a burger unless Ew. you ask for the animal style or some other different whatever <laughs> like some off the cuff or some like secret way of asking for it to be made <laughs> normally the funny part is that actually sounds aesthetically pleasing at least to have like a slice of onion going across your sandwich like it's very uniform but i just yeah, hate I onions so. i mean I it's, so. it's, it's a little it's like you got lettuce tomato onion and they're all slices of their various elements What's not to like is like as opposed to a slice of tomato, slice of lettuce, and then these little onion jimmies. It just, <laughs> it just doesn't flow, man. I like onion onions. Slice. As, I like onions. Root beer. I eat raw onions with hummus. I only, Why would you I only do like that to hummus? onions if you can't tell it's an onion anymore. Yeah. I like, can't believe when it's when it's onions. dried and all that shit. That no, I can't even do with them caramelized. But like dried onions, minced up tiny powder. ass onion shit, powder. I can onion deal with powder. Yeah. I love the taste, but I have a lot of texture aversions with food. And I'm onions, not that yeah, onions get me, man. I can't do it. I um, I like all of the above except for the solid slice of onion in a in a <laughs> burger that's otherwise <laughs> also bad. Whereas I'm a grown ass man who still has to have his friends like put onion in food without telling me so I can yeah. eat around it or like, oh, pretty you don't get onion. No, you son of a <laughs> bitch. <laughs> You but that, that me. brings me to a fun story because my husband loves hunting, obviously, because he's a redneck, right? And uh, nobody's surprised by that. But I was a I'm vegetarian. I'm very surprised, Cole. <laughs> I was a vegetarian when he and I got together. And I was always very adamant that I wouldn't eat deer meat no matter what. But I, I started to phase out of the vegetarianism there at one point. And then he was like, you know what? He goes, I'm, I'm going to grill us some burgers. I was like, okay, cool. Thinking it's hamburgers. I don't eat deer. Fuck, you know, it's fine. It's a hamburger. Uh, 
And then after I ate it, he was like, oh, those were venison burgers. And I was like, this is grounds for divorce. <laughs> but also, I really fucking love venison now. <laughs> and we there's, usually have at least two deers worth of meat in the freezer at any given time. <laughs> it's like, did he do you a favor or did he screw you over? We don't uh, know he, anymore he because it's me, delicious. Yeah, he did me a favor in the end, I guess. But it did really kind of fuck with my, <laughs> with my plans there. If I it weren't for my it. love of cheese, I'd be a vegan. <laughs> I love <laughs> cheese, so I can't let that shit go. <laughs> yeah, no. Cole that would, would appreciate wrong. that we have had a hamburger helper with deer burger it's before. Good. It yeah. It's a great meal, I hear. There's something that I make. Um, there's a There's a recipe that went around in my mom's group for a really long time where it was like, you take either a pork roast or a beef roast, put it in the crock pot, and you put a packet of dry au jus, a packet of dry ranch seasoning, a stick of butter, and four pepperoncinis in on it, right? And you put it in a crock pot and you let it go all day. And the the joke was that it, we called it pony roast um, because it, you could just put fucking any meat in there and it would work. Um, but the funny part was is like I made it once with deer meat and I swear on my life nothing else tastes. As good as the deer meat with that recipe. It looks like a like uh, a cat vomited it up. <laughs> it looks horrible. <laughs> but it tastes so good. You make it sound so appetizing. Uh, yeah, I mean, just from the looks of it. Like, you will never see me post a picture and be like, look, it's pony roast. Because, fuck no, it's gross looking. <laughs> but it just falls apart in your face. And you're like, oh, it's so it good. It takes get to your mouth. <laughs> Yeah, the the thing with it is, oh, it smells incredible though. Like you can look over how it looks if you can if you can uh, smell it. Um, the the reason it looks so odd is because you put a whole stick of butter in it and it just melts, and so like it has like kind of like a butter soup hanging out around it. Uh, <laughs> but because you don't put any other liquid, you need that stick of butter to absorb to keep the meat um, moist, especially if you're doing something lean like deer. But deer, because it's so gamey and can be tough, to make that recipe, it takes 12 hours in the crock pot. Jeez. And it is low and slow, and you are taunted by that motherfucker all day long. Well, like within, that was baby puke. Yeah. Within 30 minutes of having put it in there, you're just like, today is going to suck because I have to smell this all day. <laughs> but it's so good. Mmm, baby puke. No, no, cat puke. It looks like cat puke. I'm confusing with Indian food. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. yeah. I like Which curry, I love. But it does look like baby puke. <laughs> yeah, like I love, like I love, I love Indian food. But yeah, it looks like my gut gut. Mm. I I have not had much Indian food. My exposure to Indian food was my buddy Kunal's uh, engagement party, where they served all Indian food. I didn't know what the fuck anything was. <laughs> some of it was good. Some of all of it was spicy. Yeah. Uh, some of it was gross as it was fuck. Delicious. I'm wondering what the gross was because I feel like something's missing. <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's been like a over a year, two years since that happened. So I don't know what the hell anything was. But a lock paneer, baby. Get it in. It looks like hardcore baby puke. But man, is it good. <laughs> Oh, my God. On that note, should we talk about games? Yes. As long as they're baby puke games. Nope, they are not baby puke games. Or at least I hope they're not baby puke games. Totally. That would suck if they are. That is true. <laughs> but it would be but it would be well timed that I could describe it as such. Yeah. I hope not. I'm afraid I've got some bad news. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm here to talk about baby puke quest. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We got to get to this. First game to talk about tonight is called Liege Dragon, developed by Xcreate, published by Chemco, released August 28th on Xbox One and Windows 10 for $14.99. Uh, the evil dragon coming back to life. The kingdom of blaze was thrown into confusion. Urin, who has lost his memory, witnesses a village being destroyed and heads for the capital, hoping to find something he could do in this time of destruction. Here begins an adventure to find the dragon tools of the three heroes to confront the revived dragon and bring peace to the world. Chris, tell us about this one. Well, first off, <laughs> I didn't even realize until you said it. That the hero's name is Urin. <laughs> <laughs> or Uran. 
<laughs> yeah, it's Y U R A N, and Uran. I was like Uran or something like that, and then you're like urine, and I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah. I just. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think of that. <laughs> I just no, I really didn't. I was like, yeah, <laughs> we're twelve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so oh, yeah, Lee, you speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just about to puke all over everything. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> I had to incorporate it somehow. Um, okay, yes, Liege Dragon. So this is the uh, newest game. Well, presumably newest. I mean, they come out so often. But um, the newest game from the Chemco X Create, uh, you know, infinite combo of games that are kind of like ported from mobile um, sort of stuff in Japan, especially, and then brought over to the U.S. into consoles and such. Um because they're because like they scatter across like all kind of consoles and and systems and stuff and they don't release their stuff really in order um or you know like whatever it's kind of hard to know like how new the game really is except to say that it does seem very new that looks delicious yeah it does <laughs> anyways um I'm just so, gonna leave like, that up the whole show. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I've already eaten, so I'm not gonna be like distracted by it. <laughs> I am. Um, but you can see where I say that the the gravy kind of has that uh, questionable aesthetic. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I live in Texas. Like a lot Kimco's of people, Kimco's gonna like that. listen to this and be like, "What the hell are they talking about?" <laughs> <laughs> it's it's well, the proper name is Mississippi Rose. But we call it pony roast because you could basically roast anything except for a pony. <laughs> <laughs> Probably even uh, a pony if you were French. <laughs> oh Lord. So you can so it's called pony roast because you can roast anything but a pony, but it's not called baby roast. I mean uh, okay. back to Lee's <laughs> Dragon. <laughs> okay, so this appears to be like a, a much newer game um in the X Create thing, and there's a few reasons. Uh, why I think that is. For one, the scrolling in towns and dungeons and such is silky smooth. Um, this game actually runs at a frame rate that makes you think it was made in the last, you know, within the last 20 <laughs> years. Um, so yes, it does look new. Um, the, but they've changed a lot, like actually from the usual formulae, um, but then again, not everything has changed. So for one, and you'll notice this from the screenshots immediately, is that instead of uh, having your characters appear on screen in sprite form and then the uh, the monsters appear on the other side of the screen, like a Final Fantasy game or whatnot. I mean, an old Final Fantasy game. I don't know what they're doing now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think they're still doing that. Um Instead, battles are presented in first person, which is the first time I've seen that in an X Create jam. Because um, normally that's the the territory of hit point. Like they present all their stuff in first person in battles. Um, so yeah, now it's first person, and instead of fighting just like you know, if you're fighting a, a goblin or something, and uh, instead of it being one goblin with a health bar. It's a whole stack of goblins, like, just copied and pasted all over the place. Um, there's just, like, this big stack of goblins. And as you attack the goblins and their little life bar, the green bar there, goes down, they start to fall, fly off the screen. So you're basically fighting a stack of enemies instead of just one enemy. Um, except in the case of a boss, like this manticore here. Um, interesting but, mechanic. Yeah, it's, it's, it is interesting. Um so yeah, the enemies are kind of like stacked against you instead of just showing up as one enemy, but functionally they kind of just do the same thing. I mean, for this big pile of enemies, there's only one move that happens. So that's a, uh, it really just seems to be a style choice more than anything. And I like it actually. It kind of, uh, it reminds me of something like Dragon Force or some other kind of obscure RPG where you're, you know, fighting a lot of enemies at once kind of deal. And, uh, and it's fun to watch, like, you know. And the other thing that's fun is that, like, now that the battles are, like, first person and kind of, like, uh, a little fancier looking, then there's, like, a lot of room for these big, giant spectacle, like, spells and summons and things like that, which I've always felt uh, X-Create games are kind of lacking, like, the special effects department. So I really, uh, 
I really enjoy that. And uh, but so there's another thing that has been eliminated um, in terms of like what you'd usually see in one of these kind of games, and that's the world map. Um, rather, your ability to move around on such. Uh, while you do move around on the world map in cutscenes, you actually don't have that freedom in the game. Instead. It is literally that a, a list appears and you choose the place where you want to go. Um, there's a marker next to the place where you need to go, but you can backtrack to any place at any time and, you know, uh, get there without incident. So fast travel is now the theme of the day, which honestly, I feel like that's a good move because, you know, the world map always felt redundant in Chemco X Create games because, like, the maps are usually pretty limited. Um it's the same exact thing as walking around, like, you know, it's, there's no exploration aspect. You're always, like, kind of, you know, on a rail anyway to get to your next destination. You never have a choice of destinations. Yeah, I've, um, I've seen Chemco games where, like, the further destinations won't even be on the map until you exactly. hit a certain part of the story, and then they'll appear. Yeah. They, they always put you on rails um, with the linear, like, point A to point B thing. And honestly, the world map just doesn't ever look good <laughs> in these games. Um, again, that's just for the X-Create set. I actually think that uh, Hitpoint did a better job with their world building. So I really actually like that they took away the walking around on the world map type thing, and instead you're just choosing areas. The other cool thing is that now they can populate the map with much more realistic depictions of, like, towns and stuff. So this game has a pretty dark story um, because it's about an evil dragon that comes back to life and you have to, you know, it's it's normal RPG stuff in the, in the overall framing. It's, you know, evil dragon comes back to life, starts killing everybody, and um, your chosen heroes have to uh, go find the items from the heroes of ancient legend and, and smite the beast. However, um, you know, just like, well, without getting into too many spoilers, let's just say a lot of destruction and death happens in this game, which is, uh, a little different from the normally chill, um, X create like batch. And so, and because you can't actually just freely wander, like you'll actually see towns that you didn't go to get destroyed. <laughs> And, like, they can actually show you that because it's not like it was possible for you to go there anyway. So it kind of, like, it, it lends itself to uh, adding a little bit more uh, spice to, like, the events and, like, cutscenes. And the other thing is that it allows the game to focus way more on storytelling, which it does. Uh, there's a full hour of storytelling before I got to fight my first enemy. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, that's not quite Dragon Quest uh, 7 level. That one legendarily has a two-hour wait before you fight your first slime. Um, but they really wanted to, like, actually establish uh, the characters, the story. It's not just, you know, well, um, in the context of Kemco X Create Games, it's not just that you, like, come across a character and they instantly like join you for no real reason uh that does happen with one character actually and it's almost like a joke <laughs> like you meet a character who literally like follows you know joins you three sentences later and he's just a permanent member of the party and uh but anyways so i like that they're going in this direction of uh much more in-depth storytelling and you know like i said less it feels like less padding um, which is really nice because uh, I think that's that's a, a good thing. So the other part of this is that they've simplified some of the systems. Now the weapons eating weapons system is back, uh, so you can actually use uh, the game menu to kind of like if you get a new weapon and you like this weapon, you can absorb uh, all the other weapons that you get. And enemies drop weapons constantly, so like you can instead of selling them, which is an option, you can actually just have your current sword eat all the other swords in your inventory and it gets a stat boost and um yeah i love so that system great. yeah it's a good system and as a bonus for the first time that i've seen uh you don't have to wait if a weapon has let's say a vitality boost um of like two if you eat that weapon you get and you don't have uh you know, all your slots taken up, you can actually get that vitality too. You don't have to wait until uh, it builds up into a vitality 20 by eating other vitality um, weapons. Usually you would have to wait, and so you'd end up with this inventory full of swords that you're working <laughs> on so that you can transfer the uh, the power. And then there's a system of, uh, of 
using ores, which are rare enemy drops, or they're dropped after bosses to like further kind of customize your weapons in fun ways. Uh, the lottery system's back. It's exactly the same as it always was, or at least it is in the more recent games. Um, enemies randomly drop points or tickets, and when you get a ticket, you can play a game to try and get a better item. Uh, the game forces you to live with the results by forcing you to autosave, um, so you can't save scum uh, these mini games. But that's okay because they're not like, you know, they're just fun. And uh, of course, they also have them kind of scaled to your level, so you can't like get the game breaking final sword like immediately in the game Boo. anymore. I don't think, <laughs> unless you get like a five star rare roll, which I have not. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's all cool. The other thing I like. Finally, and this is the the last bit of the system I think I'm going to talk about, is that uh, now Magic, which, you know, the Chemco X creates that almost every game has a different way of managing their Magic. Uh, this one is probably my favorite so far, because what it is now is that instead of your, like, your characters learn skills uh, when they level up, um, you know, uh, physical arts that are unique to that character. Um, however... Also, every enemy drops uh, jewels in one of four elements. And what you do is you collect those jewels, and when you get enough, you can unlock a, uh, a magic spell in that element for any character. So it's 100% customizable magic sets for each character. Nice. Yeah, so if you get, like, 20 wind points, you can unlock a steal move. Now, one of your characters will learn how to steal as part of his natural progression, although it's a slightly different move. Um, but you can also, like, you know, add that to a different character or something like that. So you're now just collecting uh, points in distributing them however you wish. Like, none of the characters have a specific elemental affinity. However, you can build them that way. And uh, when you learn... Um, one spell and another spell that will unlock a combination spell that you can then also unlock. So lots and lots of customizability, and that is really fun. Um, okay, I lied. There's one more. <laughs> <laughs> you actually get points for defeating a certain amount of certain types of enemies. Uh, you're given this, um, I forget what the word they use for it, some French word, uh, but basically a monster dictionary. And if you fight enough battles that it will specify of a certain type of monster, or if you fill up enough entries, you will get a prize. And sometimes this prize is magic spells, sometimes it's weapons. Uh, one of the most powerful spells in the game is actually unlocked this way. Uh, so it's definitely good. It's like a completely optional like mini quest to defeat as many of one kind of monster as you can. So really cool stuff. Um, I'm actually really enjoying all of the directions that this game is taking versus the uh, the other ones. <clears throat> you know what I enjoy? I enjoy the What's fact that? that No Time for Games just gifted a sub to Heaven Smile. Oh my. Isn't that awesome, Purnell? What do you think of that? Fucking yeah! That's right, Purnell. <laughs> I was really close. I was about to say, what do you mean? The hell are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> the heck is go oh what do you think real pernell that imposter <laughs> <laughs> okay so lee's dragon 15 bucks on this one what are you thinking um if you like <clears throat> basically if the um chemco x create games like is it's a buy it and i'm gonna say that like people who aren't familiar with the Chemco X create games so far, this would be a great place to jump in because I think this game kind of, it gets to the best parts of these games much quicker than the others. Um, it doesn't feel as much like a game that was just made in RPG maker and then, you know, copy pasted across, you know, several chapters, which is a common, uh, criticism of the X create set. Like it really looks, seems like more care has gone into this one. So, and if you're a longtime fan, this is going to have some brand new stuff that you're, bound to enjoy because i really enjoyed it myself so i'm giving this one a buy it for sure sweet yeah all right next game to talk about is called nexomon extinction developed by vivo interactive published by pcube released august 28th on switch ps4 and pc for 1999 coming soon to xbox one uh, there was some kind of delay with it. I'm not sure what happened, but it should be out soon. Uh, Nexamon Extinction is a return to a classic monster catching games with a brand new story, eccentric characters, and over 300 unique Nexamon to trap, tame, and evolve. Ernell, tell us about this one. Let's get this out of the way. This is freaking Pokemon. Okay. Okay. Let's get that out of the way. Now, 
<laughs> obviously, with that said, um, Pokemon has been around for a long time, and to be quite honest, I can't. It's it's about time someone else attempted to do a game like this, just to see what would someone else do if they took the reins on a similar concept. So I was all for it, honestly, especially with everybody complaining about Pokemon lately. It's like, okay, let's see what this other studio can do. And I think this was originally a mobile game that got ported to consoles, which I'm also all for because consoles are where I play games. So there you have it. Do you not have phones? Uh, oh god you <laughs> bastard <laughs> where's cole she loves that joke <laughs> you beat me a, to it and i'm sad about it <laughs> that is that guy will never live that shit down ever 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 so this game though so um this game takes the Pokemon formula and does a few things differently, which I'm okay with, and some things that I kind of wish they didn't. Let's get started with the things they did do that I like. So, first and foremost, they do the, the similar story where it's like, you know, these kids are of a certain age around, like, you know, young kids. But instead of being, like, you're 10 years old going out on your own, in this game, your main character lives in an orphanage. And... At this point, you and your friends in the orphanage end up getting brought on to the, by the Tamers Society or Tamers Guild to start working for them as Tamers because the world that these characters inhabit is actually a world that has been decimated or heavily damaged by their Nexamon creatures, most particularly a set of them known as tyrants. They are like, think of them as like mythical critters. And they're basically all fighting to determine who will be the king tyrant that runs society. And unfortunately, humans are kind of caught in the middle of it. So they kind of give it a whole like post-apocalyptic story going on. And it's, it takes like a lot more, uh, you know, interesting turns as far as, you know, grim, not grim as in like people get murdered and crap, but grim as in this journey isn't all sunshine and farts. Um um, travel, which I kind of like as well. So, but at this point, the main character hits the road and you are pretty much taught by uh, this ghost of a dead tamer how to catch Nexamon after a series of events. And similarly to Pokemon, you get the item, in this case they're called Nexo Traps, and you have to throw the trap at the um, at the Nexamon and then enter a series of button commands to attempt to catch it. I find that kind of funny because I wonder if that was meant to pay homage to like when people used to like mash the B button to think <laughs> that it has to make it easier to catch Pokemon. Um, but you have to put in the series of commands. Now, here's one of the things about the game that I kind of I don't like, even though it's not particularly bad, but we'll get to that. So, when you catch Pokemon normally, the idea was that, hey, they have a catch rate. You catch it, boom. If you don't, you don't. And usually you would use different balls to increase your odds. In Nexamon, you have Nexatraps, but there's like multiple criteria that is used to determine if you catch this thing or not, or rather augment the percentage of the chances of you catching it. First of all, it's the normal idea. Get their hit points into the red, and that's considered how weary they are. The more weary they are, the more it adds to the percentage of capture opportunity. A new thing in this game is feeding them. After you've seen one and added it to your whatever this game's version of a Pokedex is, I think it's a journal, um, you will then be able to see what kind of foods the Nexamon likes to eat. So you can acquire that food either from finding it on the ground or certain stores and vendors, and you can feed the Nexamon those things to increase your chances of catching it. Also, their status effects... And then there's like another item called the whistle. Whistles pertain to each of the elements that Nexamon can be. And it's a stackable bonus where the more whistles you have of a certain element, the higher your odds of getting, of catching it going on with it. It has like 3% chance effectiveness per whistle. So all these things combined, you end up with a percentage. And what this ends up meaning is that you will likely miss captures more often than you would like. As in, you'll throw the ball, you know, the button commands, and you will fill... Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention, there are different types of Nexamon traps that are also more effective for catching Nexamon of that type. So all those things combined determine your chances of catching it, and unfortunately, you will be surprised how many times you mess up. And... Nexo traps aren't cheap. So you're going to, there's a bit of grinding involved to get some more Nexo traps if you're the type that wants to catch every Nexamon you see in a certain area or something. So, words of the wise, 
catch a few, get balting, and come back later when you really feel like you need to see that thing in action or whatever. Um, and that's one thing that's interesting about the game, like in that regard, like money doesn't grow on trees, next traps don't grow on trees, and in addition to go along with that, neither does healing items, which is interesting because a big complaint a lot of people tend to have about Pokemon main games. I'm sorry if this seems like I'm bringing up Pokemon a lot, but I think it's a very good comparison mm-hmm. because of how similar this game is today. I mean, um, look at the names. Yeah, it is true. Literally, Nexamon and Tamer instead of Trainer. No one's fooled by this. <laughs> but I don't, uh, I don't think they're trying to fool anyone. I think they're very clear in that they're paying homage to Pokemon. It just agree doesn't do on enough to stand on its own. I know, and I think I'm, I think I'm ended up getting to that in the end, which is a good thing. Like honestly, I guess, well, spoiler, since I think I'm slightly on the spot on that, I do like the game. Um, but um, so the other thing about it is that. A lot of complaints that people have had about Pokemon over the years is that the main game is pretty easy to the point that people start doing Nuzlocke challenges and all that stuff to kind of spruce it up a bit. Nexamon is what happens when someone says, you know what, we should make the game a little more difficult. And that has both positive and negative qualities to it. Because the positive is that, yes, I do enjoy having more challenging battles. In this case, you'll be playing singles. One versus one with your roster of up to six Nexamon in your belt. And the enemy can also have up to six Nexamon on their belt when you get into a battle. Um, elemental strengths and weaknesses also exist in this game, though sometimes the strengths and weaknesses may not be the most obvious thing to see. Like, I swear I feel like grass is strong against psychic. But, uh, um, but when you get into combat, if you get a like, Pokemon, if you, if a Pokemon faints, and you throw another Pokemon in, that's like a free switch. Pokemon dies, your one comes in, and now you get a turn. And Nexamon, if you switch Pokemon mid-battle, that's the turn, is putting the Nexamon in. However, if your Nexamon faints, and you put a new Nexamon in to replace it, that also counts as a turn. So Uh. basically... You don't want Nexamon to faint because you are literally just giving the opponent a free turn after killing your dude. On the positive, it's like, okay, that's cool. It's kind of like a reward for knocking the guy out. On the negative, it kind of sucks if you got a Nexamon in the back that's kind of barely hanging on and he's getting thrown out just to pretty much get killed. <laughs> so that kind of blows. Um, but aside from that, it's similar ideas. You have know, four attacks ranging from various elements. Uh, but one thing I like about this game actually is that they do differently is how speed works. So in Pokemon, you have a Pokemon speed determines how fast it is. And there's also priority attack, you know, priority level one, two, blah, blah, blah. And this game is a combination of the Nexamon speed stat plus the speed stat of the attack. So you might have an attack that does some damage and it has a speed of 56 and the attack that does a lot of damage, but has a speed of 24. And at that point you're thinking, okay, well, I'm, I think I'm still fast enough for this guy that even with the slow, powerful attack, I'll go first. And also you're taking a wonder if, if the other guy's going to use a powerful, slow attack also to kind of balance it out. But you can also be like, you know, I'm about to die. I don't want to switch out a guy. So I think I want to take this chance to do like a quick hit with my slow, my fast but weak attack, and hopefully it kills the guy. So there's a little bit of added elements of strategies of that that I genuinely came to appreciate in the game as I played it. So... With the way this how this works is that as you're playing around the game, you're exploring it, you come to realize that the overall goal of the game becomes to locate a bunch of tyrant Nexamon, defeating them, thereby using them to summon the light tyrant, which is supposed to be a good one, and then that supposedly saves the day. But of course there's other weird elements that factor in, including like some person who stops time to talk to you and all kinds of weird mess. So honestly the story has me slightly interested because I'm curious as about where they're going to go with it because it's not, it doesn't look like it's as simple as, hey, happy go lucky journey to catch a bunch of Nexamon. It's more like the world's actually on the verge of death. And uh, behind these colorful graphics, people are dying out there. <laughs> people are starving in the wild. So it's an interesting, like, you know, juxtaposition of, you know, graphic style to like severity of the mission and also the humor. And for the record, the humor in this game is pretty solid too. Your main character is a solid protagonist, aside from like the occasional character option for dialogue you get. But to balance that out, they give you a cat friend named Coco that tags along with you. And Coco is purely comic relief. Like, 
tons of sarcastic replies, tons of like fourth wall breaks in their dialogue. And I expected it to be cheesy, but I genuinely laughed out loud, not to use the meme version, but the actual action of laughing out loud multiple times as I played the game and Coco responded to ridiculous nonsense, usually related to Trump breaking tropes in the genre. Um, so I honestly enjoyed that element. The really only <laughs> things that I wish they did do, or at least, in this case, more so aped on Pokemon 4 was in this game, all the Nexamon have single elm elements. So it's a grass type Nexamon or fire type Nexamon. There are no grass fire Nexamon, um, which lessens some of the, um, the strategic abilities you can use. They do sometimes get mixed of attacks. So you might, you'll get multiple elements with one guy, but not having two elements shakes up a little bit on the strategy line. Um, so I wish there was a little bit of that going on. Um, I also wish that it was easier to get money because the best way to get money in this game is to battle trainers like Pokemon, but trainers can regenerate for rematches quicker than you'd expect. Like you go off the screen, you go two screens over, potentially come back and the trainer's ready to go again, which could backfire if you're trying to walk past them to get to a healing spot. And they're like, yo, I'm ready to rematch you. Let's see what's going on, buddy. So just be mindful of that. Um, there is quick travel that you unlock, which is kind of nice though. Um, as far as it goes, the music is also pretty nice. I enjoy the music in the game. Um, battles, there's on the one positive there also with battles is that you can, we walk in tall grass to fight monsters, but you can see the grass that's holding a dumb Nexamon wiggling. So there are no random encounters in this game too. You choose when you want to fight essentially which is nice. Um, I'm trying to think what I may be missing out on as far as descriptions go, because I feel like I've rambled the game to death. Oh, <laughs> that's what I meant to ask. That's what I meant to say. Okay, ways you get things. So there's stores in the game where when you come across store, the, the main store and also some of the merchants even, you have a, hum, uh, a tamer rank, and as you level up your tamer rank, the store will sell more stuff and you'll get it for a, a cheaper amount of money. In addition to that, to make the different traps, aside from buying them from overpriced merchants, you can build them yourself by finding elemental shards out in the wild, and you can then go to a particular shop, combine them into um, into traps, like elemental traps, to catch next in mind, and of course increase the odds of catching them. There is quests that you can undertake, undertake in the game, usually by given by NPCs if you come across them, and the quests usually involve bringing them a Nexamon that they want for trade, or a certain number of items, or money, and then they'll give you a reward in return. One thing I hate about that, though, is that the game does keep track of your quest that you found, but they don't tell you where the quest was located if you're trying to get back to it. You just have to know where it is based uh, on what the description is. I hate I that. I dislike that. You and me both, sir. It's annoying. Really annoying. <laughs> um, but aside from that, the quests are there. Um, and then there is also just... Actually, I don't think there is a also. Oh, the equipment element. So this game has four attacks that the Nexamon can have. But in addition to that, the form of equipment in the game comes in the form of cores. You can create cores at the lab in the main city using shards to ha-ha. And um, those cores provide you with a variety of different effects. Increase attack power, defense power, increase speed, increase experience gain, increase money earned. Um just a variety of different things. You can equip up the four cores per Nexamon, and you'll want to do that. I'm primarily experienced and greed because I'm experienced and greedy. Um, I wanted those things. So now I think I've rambled as much <laughs> as I can think of about this game because I've pretty much said everything there is to do in the game. And my ultimate thought on it is that I think it's a fun title. Um, just come into it knowing that it is not a short romp by virtue of the grind alone. You're going to be grinding not just because you want to see evolutions of your next month, but also simply because you're going to be backtracking just to keep your dudes healed up between either random encounters or trainer battles. Or sorry, tamer battles. So um, just give me that forewarning. But if you're a fan of Pokemon games or monster catching games in general, I feel like this is a, a solid, you know, alternative to play around with just to see what other monster designs another company can come up with. Which, for the record, there are legitimate. After seeing over 800 new Pokemon, I'm surprised that there are a bunch of Nexamon, which are about things like 381 in this game. Um, there, I've seen a lot in this game where I'm like, you know, this is a pretty cool Nexamon design. I want to catch that too. <laughs> so. 
you know, there are, there are some cool ones that you'll see in the game that you'll be like, I want to use that in my team. So cool. So overall, your official verdict, it's Pokemon. It's 20 bucks. What do you say? I honestly think it's a buy. Oh, last thing I should mention um, is single player only. So a downside is that you're not going to build a next amount team to battle your friends. The positive mm. is that you don't have to play this game thinking about a meta game. You're just going to play it saying, I want to catch next amount to play through the game, which is also cool. So. All right. Sounds good. It is. <laughs> All right. Next game to talk about is called Alpha Set by Paugi, developed and published by Lightwood Games, released August 25th on PS4 and Vita, 27th on the Switch for $7.99. This new puzzle is a mix of crosswords and Sudoku, challenging both your vocabulary and your deduction skills. There are 26 blank squares. Each letter of the alphabet must be placed exactly once in order to fill the grid with valid English words. Reveal a terrible joke each time you solve a puzzle <laughs> in Lightwood fashion. Right, Chris? <laughs> Did they actually call it terrible? Yes. Reveal a terrible joke each time you solve a puzzle. That's amazing. Yes. They know. They know what they they're know. doing. <laughs> they know. <laughs> Well, okay. I'm glad that description wasn't much longer because that would be the entire review. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so finally, by the way, a Paugi game or Pogi, Paugi, Paugi. Oh no, right? I say Paugi. Well, they we we had them confirm once that it was Paugi. I remember now. But yeah, like it's been a long ass time since I've gotten to review one of their games, so it was really nice to see this one come through. Um, I even had to start a PS4. Uh, European account, <laughs> just to get it, <laughs> which is nice. Now I have a little race car, and my name is Chris UK. Chris UK, nice. <laughs> I think mine's Joe Camnet EU. Nice, nice. I had to actually look up a. I had to Google a London uh, post office box <laughs> <laughs> zip code, whatever they call it, something else there. And um, I just I made one up, so I don't know. Not made one up, but I mean I looked one up and just chose it at random. Anywho's. <laughs> I'm banning this review because it's very short. <laughs> so <laughs> the way this game goes. Okay. So there is, so, you know, like I said, in Paugi, we know them because they basically come out with these uh, word games where the premise is always very simple. It just, it's simply one kind of puzzle and you just do it uh, again and again until it's all done. <laughs> and this is no exception. Uh, so yes, the, and I should have written down how many puzzles there are. There's a lot of puzzles. It's like... I'll see if uh, I can look it up. Yeah, look it up while I'm talking. <laughs> so, basically, in every puzzle, um, there are words arranged like a crossword. However, most of the letters in each word is already filled in. And your job is to basically go through the alphabet panel on the right side and uh, choose a letter and place it in one of the blank panels. Now, of course, uh, the trick here is that each letter can only be used once and a lot of the words will make sense with more than one different kind of letter so it's really all about trying it um trying to get at the easier words first like the real obvious ones like it's just missing one letter and you know exactly which one it could possibly be and then kind of whittle it down to the uh to the ones that have multiple choices or just like kind of fill them out as as you like and you know you can always erase your <clears throat> You know, you can always erase what you've done. And there's also a free checker that you can use. And it's one of those things where it does not penalize you for using the checker. It's just completely um, at your discretion. Oh, that's it will good. tell you if you've made any mistakes. And that's simply what it does. Yeah, I can't find like, anything that says how many puzzles there are. I looked on both the store pages. I don't see anything. Oh, uh, okay. That's too fine. lazy to do any more work than that. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It's... um. It's like, I think it's 60 at least. Um, so anyways, yeah. So like, basically it's just all about, like, I was actually surprised at how challenging, um, the game is and it seems to not really scale in difficulty. Um, I'm sure like there's more obscure words used in the later puzzles, but like, because you can choose, you can actually choose any puzzle at any time. Uh, you could just scroll through and like pick one. Uh, so it's not, it doesn't make you do them in any linear order. Uh, and I tried like the very last puzzle and I was doing just fine on it. So I think that it's, uh, it's, it's a very even challenge. And yeah, it really does, uh, test out your vocabulary because not only, um, are there words that you might, 
might not recognize like you know it doesn't get too advanced i don't think but there are you know there's a couple of obscure ones in there uh for the most part it's just like you know you just keep punching in letters or something until you have like an aha moment and uh <laughs> like i said it's especially useful if you see a couple of obvious ones and start doing those and plus it helps me it, it really helped me to take like to basically use uh scrabble scoring <laughs> because mm-hmm. i'm a very good scrabble player so i'll be like okay, what set of letters looks like it would most fit an X in? And so I'd look for like an X or a Z opportunity. And uh, that kind of helped me eliminate those letters so that the ones that are used in way more words, like the vowels and stuff, were uh, easier to place. So, you know, there's little ways you can strategize it uh, with yourself. But overall, it's a Palgy game, so it's just a good puzzly time. Uh, puzzles are expertly crafted. The puns are expertly terrible. <laughs> It's not just puns. Um, Any good ones like, you know off the top of your head? Yes. Um, <laughs> I think it's the joke that you get after the uh, after puzzle number two. But, um, yeah, the guy was like, <laughs> or the dog comes up and is like, I saw an ad for a, uh, for a cemetery plot, and I thought, that's the last thing I need. <sighs> <laughs> it wasn't a pun. It was just a bad joke. Yeah. Yeah, expect a lot of size like that. Um, yeah, and like I said, as far as the options go, they're very limited. Um, you can do light mode or dark mode. It just turns the background from white to kind of a light gray. And uh, you can turn the music on or off, which I like the music, but I do turn it off <laughs> because I like to listen to other things while I'm um, doing puzzles and stuff. Like, like the SML podcast. <laughs> like the SML podcast, exactly. Not just any podcast. The Good SML Lord. podcast. The one where I get to hear my own voice. Yeah, right, Purnell? Fucking yeah! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny because we can't hear the, the samples in the in the Skype call, so I knew that was actual Purnell yelling. <laughs> <laughs> it was both. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of cow a little bit of cow me. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. All right, Alpha set by Paugi, eight bucks on it. What do you say? I say it's a buy it for people who like word games. Um, I actually have not come across this one yet in my travels. So it was a really fun new experience and not just one of the, um, not just one of the classics. So yeah, if you're looking to give Palgi games a try and you want to try something that's not standard crosswords or word search or, you know, uh, anagrams or anything like that, like give this one a go. It's surprisingly challenging for as simple as the premise is. So I say it's a buy it. Awesome. Yep. All right, next game to talk about is called Hexagroove Tactical DJ, developed and published by Ichigo Ichi. Uh, yeah, Ichigo Ichi A released August 28th on Xbox One for $29.99. I had to think on the name there for a second. Uh, <laughs> Hexagroove combines elements of strategy, rhythm, and action games in a unique blend of self-expression. Your goal as a DJ is to combine musical loops in real time to regulate a virtual audience's energy, working them into a state of euphoria with your artistic skills. The action swings from contemplative to frantic as you move between song sections in one of 10 dance music genres. Purnell, we talked about this one earlier in the show with the creator. So why don't you just tell us what you thought of it? Honestly, I'm glad we had that dialogue with him, too, because I was able to experience some of the stuff that he mentioned after getting better at the game. And I actually did get better at it. And what I ended up realizing is that I genuinely did find myself enjoying the game. It, it's fun to play. And once you start unlocking the different sound patterns and the traits that are associated with them, you find yourself deciding which loop to play on a on a on an instrument or, or i guess on a loop technically on an instrument i'll call it an instrument you're trying to decide on which loop to play on an instrument you get to the point where you're like you know i need i have the room to spare i'm going to play the one that gives me more euphoria at the cost of my health you know stuff like that and you're honestly having a good bit of time with it the creative element is going to be dependent on the actual player though because there are people out there just like i want to get high scores or just do well on a song and then walk away from it. But there will be other people that will get access to these different loop sounds and instrument combinations you can pull off. And they will likely want to come up with some really cool sounds fitting within the genre that's being provided to them, the genre and the instruments being provided to them. So and for those people, it's like a double bonus. So I, I honestly would just- wouldn't be shocked to see somebody do a full DJ set using this game. Maybe not like it's a totally full possible. DJ set, but you know what I mean? I, I could see this being used in an actual DJ set. 
It totally could. Like, I feel like the only thing it could possibly, the only thing that would suck if you try is, unless you can do it in freestyle and I didn't notice it, changing genre. Like, if you wanted to do Chip Rock, for example, they give he gives you a lot to work with in Chip Rock. Or obviously all of them, really, but I'm just mentioning Chip Rock. But he gives you a lot to work with. But eventually, I can picture our audience being like, okay, I want the next thing. Let's switch over to something. You're like, fuck. I just got chip rock. So quit to menu, regard. load up new song. <laughs> exactly. Just keep pumping your hand. Keep pumping one hand while with the other hand you're messing with the controller to switch. That's menu, why. Switch that's why genres. you have two of them going. That's why turntables have two record players, so you could swap between them. So you have two Xboxes set up, and then you just switch between <laughs> two the two hexa grooves. Yes, two copies of hexagroup playing, and you're just swapping between the two of them as you need. Now, that's actually hilarious, yet also effective. I can see that being ridiculous, yet that's a MAGFest thing right there. Um, David's going to listen to this, and he's going to be like, you know, they said they had one good idea every show. They had two this time. <laughs> damn right. Holla! <laughs> but also, like, it, I feel like they did a, he did a good, well, I guess it's because at least the studio, but they, all of them, did a fantastic job with this game. Like, it like I said in the interview, it's very unlike any rhythm game I've ever played. Like, it has some similarities, obviously, but overall, it's an experience that you won't get from any other rhythm game. And in that regard, I think it is totally worth someone's time. If you're up for paying full price for games, I say it's worth full price. But if you're the type that also is like, I want to take a bit of a, I want to take a way for a sale or something, that's fine too. But ultimately, no matter what you decide to do, I think it's a buy it title if you're into rhythm games. I would honestly go more on a try it side uh, for two reasons. One is the price is a little high, but I understand music licensing is a bitch and that's just part of the cost of music games and licensing. So that's out of our control. I, I just wish it were a little cheaper personal preference. Number two, it is just really complex and there is a lot to learn in this game. And if you don't have the patience to sit and learn this game, you're not going to have a good time. If you, I'll be I'll, honest though. I'll be honest. Like that's I, that's what I thought. It, it somehow it was it was just that dialogue with David. Like when he made that comment about um about when he confirmed that turning off loops isn't particularly a bad thing. That's when it clicked because the one element that was lacking in like you remember how in the interview I was like, man, I keep failing this darn song. I don't mm-hmm. know what I'm doing wrong. The one thing that I was screwing up. Is that um, when you play a note, the note generates euphoria, which is in the center of the screen. And you can tell how, how powerful the generation is by the thickness of the purple orbs that are flowing to the center of the screen. Over time, it generates less euphoria until it eventually generates no euphoria. Now, before we realized that what was going on, all we knew was, you know, if the notes are blue, that's good. If the notes are green, you might want to change them or whatever, right? But due to the fact that you want that euphoria meter to trip out, you're going to find yourself thinking, you know, this thing isn't putting in the work anymore. And due to the fact that I am getting a little bit low and I want to push this euphoria up, I'm going to intentionally shut that one off. So you go over and you shut it off. And then there's a beat that's going around the outside of the screen. One, two, three, four. And once you hear someone tell you this is what that is, it becomes very noticeable. But when I didn't know what it was, it was just kind of like, oh, it's, 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 it's like visual aesthetics. But once I realized it wasn't, what you end up doing is going to turn this off on the first beat and on the fourth beat, turn it right back on, but with a different loop. Or the same loop. It doesn't even matter until you start getting the, you know, the powers. Um, and at that point, you start generating euphoria again. So as long as you keep that going, you don't bomb the mini games that happen between, you know, during the set transitions, you just pretty much stay alive. No. And it's odd because it sounds like a lot when we're talking about it, but it's just saying, I'm going to sit down and just do it. And if they're listening to this episode, they'll have the guy telling us why, like, Oh, dude, no, that thing that the tall guy did, he's fucking it up. Do this instead. <laughs> and that'll resolve it. Like, it'll, it, 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 it just clicks. That was like the missing piece of the puzzle. So that's why, like, I wanted to make sure I made that element of, like, if you do music games already, like, if you're into, like, the whole set of them all, like, getting in, learning the rules, whatever, this is totally doable. It's Absolutely. just that one bit. 
Yeah, I, I agree on that. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a solid game. Uh, rhythm fans absolutely should keep their eyes on this one and give it a go. Uh, and thanks again, David, for coming on and chatting with us. That was really fun. It was hilarious. <laughs> All right. One final game to talk about tonight is called A Hero and a Garden, developed by NPCKC, published by Rattalaka Games, released August 28th on Xbox One, Switch, and PS4 for $4.99. Once upon a time, there was a princess trapped in a tower by an evil witch. Would anyone attempt to rescue her? A brave hero attempted to save her, but things didn't exactly work out for him. In a twist of fate, our young hero is now forced to repay all the damage he caused to the local monster villagers by growing a garden? Chris? <laughs> It's always good when the description ends with a question mark. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who even knows what this is? Okay, so um, this is basically a like a hero in a garden is a visual novel and kind of like a button fidgety game. <laughs> <laughs> because like to call it gameplay, it would be um, I don't know. I, I don't know that I would. So it's, it'd be it's unfair to gameplay. Like it's it's meant to be like a cl a clicker. A clicker, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yes, your hero, who we eventually learn is named Cyrus. Um, basically, yeah, the the story begins that he. It it's interesting too because like it's the intro is so vague. I, it took me two times starting the game over to figure out what was really going on. Um, <laughs> and uh, well, I. I Dark Meek is asking if it's on Xbox or Steam. I actually don't know. Yes. I played it on PS4. It's okay. on everything. A Hero it's in the Garden, everything. Xbox, Switch, PS4, 499. Yeah, it's a rattle like a so yeah. <laughs> figure it's on everything. Yep. Um so yes, so your hero basically is trying to rescue a princess who is in a tower or whatever, and you know, nobody would go and try and rescue this uh princess because there's an evil witch who, you know, uh, nobody wants to deal with. So our hero decides that he's going to do it, and he marches up, and before he can climb the tower and claim the princess, he is hit by a bolt of uh, something and cursed. So now, his uh, his curse is that basically he wakes up in this like kind of, uh, I'm gonna say like a, it's weird, because it has a storefront, but it's otherwise a garden. So, like a florist? <laughs> anyways he it's kind of slowly explained to him that basically what he's there to do is he's there to pick um berries that grow really fast but only when a human is around um them which you know is why they don't grow when you're doing the actual story time bits and you know so there's two modes of the game one is where you are basically picking berries and it starts off with just one uh there's one bear a uh, bush in the middle and every time a berry pops up you can hit square if three berries pop up a basket appears and you can press square and it picks all three berries um if you do nothing i don't know what happens because i didn't do that <laughs> i was like i'm getting the best ending so i'm gonna pick everything um as the story progresses, like basically you're you're given orders like how many berries you're supposed to pick, and it starts at like ten and then goes to like fifteen, twenty, and then all the way up to a hundred. And uh, you know, of course it starts over every time you get a new order. And um every time that you fill an order, a little bit more story happens. And eventually you get more bushes up to five. Each one is mapped to a button, so eventually you've got square going, triangle going, circle going, uh, R1 and L1 going, and just as the berries appear, they all appear like you know intermittently, and you just press the button as they appear, and just keep picking them until you fulfill the orders. You know, give the order, get the storyline, and then um, every time there's storyline, of course, since you're selling the berries, you get money, and there's a list of different things that your hero has destroyed um, in this monster town that you must rebuild with the money that you earn. And, of course, once he's done with that, then the curse is lifted and he can leave. Um, but as the story goes on, you find that it's more complicated than that. Um, you learn more about the princess. You learn more about the hero's relation to the princess you learn more about the witch you befriend certain monsters and you even befriend um monsters that you have like hurt with your actions 
And so a lot of it is like your hero really dealing with his role as a hero and like what that means. And, you know, that's kind of like a popular thing now, thanks to like Undertale. And, you know, we're seeing Moon come out and that's like one of the first games to actually do the whole, you know, uh, the hero is not actually the hero type of thing. And so this is like kind of like that. It's a little bit of a um, an alternate take on like the morality of uh fantasy tropes you know yeah and uh it's a really interesting read and it's just basically broken up by staring at a bunch of bushes and pushing a button as you see (laughs) berries appear and then checking your list and seeing if you have enough or uh and then you know doing the stories and then buying the things and you know you keep doing that until you get to the ending there's several endings uh you know basically the more orders you fill for different characters, the more that character likes you and therefore you can have an ending with that character. But if you do what I did and try to get all of the berries all of the time and, you know, clear out all of the, uh, different, um, levels of things, you actually do get a mini ending with every character. Anyway, you can just choose to have like a kind of second ending with them. Um, and then, yeah, as far as that goes, uh, the visual novel, like actual options are for things like, um, you know, fast tracking the story until you come to an option that uh, you'd be able to make. And, you know, like kind of the usual stuff for Rattalika. Um Sadly, there's no text changing options. So I wouldn't call this one of the more um, accessible games. It's all kind of written in this fairly standard, sort of looks like a hand-drawn style of font. Um, music's pretty good. Uh, you can listen to the entire soundtrack if you've heard all the songs. Uh, there's a gallery and, you know, kind of a collection of endings and things like that. So all in all, you know, pretty good little package for uh, for a $5 Rattalika game. And like I said, the actual story, it wouldn't have worked if the story itself wasn't interesting, but I actually did find myself wanting to see how, you know, the hero character would interact and kind of uh, grow internally as he got to know all of these uh, different creatures. Yeah. Paul, oh, did you play this one as well? I did. I beat it too. Um, yeah, me too. I was I was actually very desperately trying to find out if it was the same developer as um, Syrup and the Ultimate Suite. The art style is very similar, but it doesn't look like it's the same artist. Yeah. Um, Isn't that the one... Is that the one I played too? Yeah, I think so. Where you have like the the candy girl. And yeah. No, it, it seems a little different than that. Maybe, maybe there's another one I'm thinking of. It has like the the very um, common chibi like comic art style to it. It's very simple, very over cute, and it's like uh, a little kiddish, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and it's very flat. Like there's no shading or anything. It's cute. It's adorable. It works for it. Um, I'm I'm not mad about it or anything. It's just that. I was just describing it because you didn't. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. That's that's <laughs> their only you. game on Xbox, but they have a couple others on There's, PC. Yeah, it looks like they have a, a really solid um, portfolio on itch, itch.io, IO, however you say it. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I saw one of the, their other ones somewhere else and just, I don't know, made a, made a mental cross wire somewhere maybe i do shit like that but anyway uh, <laughs> <laughs> um i thought a lot of the same things as Chris. it was it was easy to play but it was it was actually an interesting kind of story where you're like well you know s- seeing the the main character actually have to interact and deal with the fact that he fucked shit up when he <laughs> was trying to save the princess um i thought it was cutie and it, it it wasn't something that would like I'd be like oh putting down the release date on my calendar or anything for it mm-hmm. but hey for five bucks if I come across it yeah I'd pick it up. Nice. I would. I think the one thing I don't know if it has this I couldn't find it in any options but I would like to have been able to read this without actually playing the game part <laughs> like for <laughs> yeah. a second time through. It was fine the first time through. I was like okay I mean you know there's. There's really not much to this. I don't even know if you can lose it because it was too easy. I would have had to try. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know if there's a bad ending in this game. I don't I don't think so. I think you just like as far as I'm aware, it doesn't progress until you fulfill the the requirements. I actually yeah. was just like mindlessly filling the requests and then looked up and had like seven thousand dollars and I was like, Oh, I guess I should actually go like fix the roads and shit. Yeah, and uh, once you hit the 100 threshold, then that usually ends a character's, like, arc with you. Yeah. And the the square one is finished so much sooner than the rest that I was like, yeah. okay, maybe there's something that will happen if I keep collecting them. So I kept collecting them. Nothing. All that happens is that it just caps out at nine ninety nine. And yeah. <laughs> you don't do any. Nothing else comes of it. So once you're done with a certain arc, you can just feel free to stop and just let that basket sit there. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah. Um, I th- there there are different endings because you choose one of the characters to go to the fair with. Yeah. Um, but you can save scum it for the achievements. You can actually just save it right before you make your final choice. Well, not and, well. In at least in the version I played, you can't when it's on the choosing screen. Yeah, which you I can't didn't, at that point. But you can't. So I didn't know that. So the last save <laughs> I had made was like an hour prior so, <laughs> so I, that up for myself. I have to i have to confess that like i have a pretty bad habit with visual novels like anytime i've made any series of choices i'm like well save it here save it here save it here and I then that way that. at any point i'm like i can't go back i don't care <laughs> so i i knocked it out but i just have to go back and reload my save and do the different choices over to finish the yeah. completion i'll just play the game again i mean it takes a like really if you play it fairly casually, like I did, uh, it takes about an hour to an, mm-hmm. maybe an hour, 15 minutes to get through the story. So I could just oh, get bad. there again and no. yeah, just save scum the rest of the uh, <laughs> endings. <laughs> All right. Well, five bucks, your official verdict from the both of you. Buy it. Yes. I I think it's a buy it. I yeah. actually really enjoyed this one. Because it's five bucks. I mean. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it would be a great game for kids, too, because, it, you know can kind of teach them a little bit of uh of like thinking about what they do in video games and stuff like that which is a valuable thing to be able to approach something from a different standpoint but also like it's a nice little you know kind of you know do what a you know interaction it's a it's a very simple interaction so i think that it would be good for us a young set sounds good yeah. All right. Well, that is it for this episode. We made it through another one. Congratulations, everybody. We're still Hooray. here. We did it. Uh, uh, thanks to all of you. Did we for... truly do it? <laughs> yeah, did we, we did, really? Pernell. We did. Don't don't are negate you... our accomplishments, Pernell. Are you sure? Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. We totally did. <laughs> thanks again to all of you for being here, doing your thing. Thanks to Tim for coming on, doing his review and chatting about his Lego escapades. Uh, <laughs> thanks again to David from Ichigo Ichie for coming on, chatting about Hexagroove with us. It is an awesome game. Go check it out. It is on Xbox and Switch for 30 bucks. Uh, go give it a look. Give it a play. Make some cool music. And uh, we're going to end the show with the credits theme from Hexagroove. So anybody have any final words? Uh, go. Sorry. No, you, you, sir. sir. Oh, I was just going to say, go play moon. Cow jumped over the moon. Yeah, yeah. Jump over that shit. <laughs> <laughs>